Hello, hello. We're back again. This is the Union Tapes episode number 19. And it's with none other than Taj Mahalic. There's not much I could say about this guy that hasn't been said a million times before. So I'll keep it brief. Get it down, ya. <laughs> Born raised like what you was into when you was a kid and just like <sighs> for stretching my memory, it's way back. Um Born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I don't think we actually lived there, that was just like where the hospital was. Uh and I kind of moved around every year or two as a kid. But always kind of in between Detroit, Ann Arbor and Flint, which is like a little triangle in the part of Michigan that looks like a hand. Uh, never really in the cities, but moved around a lot. And I don't really know when I found EMX, but like bikes were what I wanted to do. I wanted to ride bikes all the time from my earliest memories. Um, but I didn't know about BMX till I was like 13 or 14. Oh, like, okay. Like for a while, I remember I had, when I was like 10, I had like a, you know, a department store road bike. Yeah. But I was just as happy, like just trying to hit jumps on that. Just, I wanted to like see how far I could go. But I never really knew about BMX. I didn't see rad or have any of those moments, you know? Okay. Well, what year was that, was that that you had a road bike? Do you remember? 83. 83. Okay. So it's right at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And what, what was, can you remember why you wanted to jump bikes? That I don't remember, but that's what I thought it was. That's all I thought I wanted to do. Is I just wanted to see how far I could jump off any little, like, you know, bump in a ditch or something, you know, yeah. or curb cut. And like, I have a very vivid memory of, I had a BMX bike point at this time, but like there was some little jump in front of a pizza shop and I was hitting it and some guy came up to me on a really fancy bike with three piece cranks. Okay. <clears throat> He's challenged me to a style, to a jumping contest. And I'm like, Oh hell yeah. <laughs> and I'm just pedaling across the parking lot going as far as I can. And he's like, just going up in the air and like, just like kicking his back in down and getting out. Like, I don't know what the hell he was doing. He's like, and he told me, you won in distance, but I won in style. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What style? You know, he tried to explain it to me. But uh, somewhere when I was around 13 or 14, I kind of found out a bit about BMX racing and wanted to do that. And I think when I was maybe 14, I went to my first race. Okay. Well, can you remember how you saw your first BMX? Did you, did you, that, that kid who challenged you to the jumping contest was obviously the first BMX you saw. Yeah, pretty much. I think, I mean, I had a BMX. Gosh, how did I get in? I mean, I don't remember. I don't remember the first time I saw it. I just remember figuring out that there was BMX bikes instead of, you know, like a road bike was the wrong tool yeah. to be jumping distance on. And yeah, I don't know. I think a cousin gave me like an old mongoose frame or oh, okay. something, you know? I think it was one of those deals. But once I found out about racing, I started, you know, finding magazines in the yeah. bookstore and stuff and uh, started saving up for a real bike. What did you, what was you getting? Like BMX Plus and... BMX Action. Okay. I remember the most. That was early, yeah. Yeah. Uh, lots of racing, you know. And somewhere in there was like, they started running like pictures of like Fuzzy and Mad Dog. Oh, okay, yeah. You yeah. know, jumping and that seemed really cool. That appeal, yeah, that was what sort of appealed to your most, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> How would you get into the races? Uh, it was, there was a racetrack, Waterford Oaks BMX was like 15 miles away. Oh, okay. I could pedal there. Um, I had a, a grandpa from via a stepdad who would take me to the races sometimes too. And like, was really help you know, helping me you know get to them oh cool yeah and you, you obviously knew then that there was a scene with racing when you you raced yeah 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 i mean i was never that great at it but i enjoyed it yeah you know i just kind of wanted to hit jumps though uh but i raced from like 13 to 15 and you know 15 x but like Never really went to nationals or anything like that. Was there was there like famous races that you saw at them races or? There was, yeah, like uh, and that actually that track. 
I don't remember a whole lot of it being too challenging, but the, there used to be, I mean, this is a little kid memory, so it might not be as big as I thought it was, but I remember the first jump was like really tall and just like a first jump, like there was no landing. So you had to learn how to speed jump, like pull up manual over it, going really fast, or you would just launch the flat and blow up. And so I had to learn that skill like really early. I remember Barry McManus was there. Like he was a monster at that. Like okay. I could speed jump like uh he was like one of the pros and all right jeff sangova and brian colgrove was he's, i think he's my age but he was like amazing rider yeah was there um and ron kimler was starting to show up around the ron okay. kimler actually went to the same high school as well i finally ended up at a high school that he went to he was like three years older than me but he was like a you know a real rider and he was already accomplished yeah i think know. did he race as well then yeah He'd come out there with me. He never really raced that much. Okay. He'd go to the track and hit jumps. And you, what you guys just used to jump on the track mostly rather than race. Yeah, I tried to race, but yeah, I mean jumping was where was that? Okay, cool. And what was uh, what was so this is like what eighty six, eighty seven? You think probably yeah, getting closer to yeah, late eighties, eighty eight, eighty nine. If, yeah, if um, Fuzzy and Mad Dog were in a mags, it'd be like, yeah. <coughs> and um, wh- who was like your early BMX crew? Like Kimler? Um, was there like other riders or was it just like really sparse at that point? Because they were really, dying out, wasn't it? Really sparse. And like for a long time, I was pretty solo, you know. Um, Ron, so this is a story I actually kind of don't remember, but it sounds cool. Ron would tell the story of how he had kind of a group of riders that he'd ride with. And I would like follow them around, but I was too shy to talk to them. And he tells the story of where I like hid in the bushes and watched all them hit this jump that was in the woods. And then after they left, I went out and like tried the stuff they were doing. Oh, okay. Like they like snuck back around and watched me. So like it, we didn't, you know, we didn't really hang out. But then eventually, Ron did kind of adopt me and started like taking me to contests. Oh, and, okay. Um, like when I was like sixteen, he took me to a rampage contest, which was oh, like amazing. A, eight hour drive away and I didn't have any money, you know, he paid for the whole thing. And, um, so he was really, really important to like getting me started and getting out there. Was there other guys from, from that scene that were known or was, was it just Ron that was the most standout? It was pretty much Ron, you know, about this time we started connecting with the Albies crew. Oh, okay. So there's, you know, Flipper and like a number of guys that were kind of albies, but they were like an hour away. So we didn't really ride with them too yeah. much. And what, so that was, what rampage was that? The first one? First one in the bowling alley. Yeah. Like oh, the wow, really amazing. old one. Uh, my main memory of that is two things. There was the box jump had the same lip as takeoff or landing. I mean, so there was no like wedge landing. It was like, yeah, lip, it was lip, tranny to tranny. which was unheard of back then. It was really hard for me to ride. And then, we stayed there. Like we just slept in the skate park and rode all night long, like all night. McCoy was there. I remember and he chased me around in the middle of the night, like playing swap rocks, smacking rocks at me. But yeah. Was, um, was that the contest that they filmed? You, you know, one of them's on, on film with, uh, Kurt Schmidt doing a bunch of like mm. really advanced stuff. I mean, and actually Dennis McCoy as well. It might be one of those, it Trend could be. Video, maybe. I mean, this this is pretty old. There was a number of them though, and they're all kind of blended together. Oh, okay. Oh, there was. You went to more than one of that. Yeah, like we used to go out to Rampage all we could because I mean, even though it was eight hours away, it was kind of like the nearest skate park for. Oh, okay. Wow. And uh, you know, it, you could just ride all night. You know, so it's yeah. pretty cool. Was you breaking bike parts at that point as well? Yes, but more just because I couldn't afford a real bike. You know, okay. I, I can't remember what I had, but. It was just anything I could keep rolling, you know. Um, what, what, can you remember what sort of riding you was doing at that point? Was it just jumps or jumps is what I was into? Uh, I mean, we'd ride anything on the street, you know. But I don't think I was doing rails back then. Somewhere around there, so too. But um, I mean, if we found a ramp, we'd surely ride a ramp. Yeah. But, so did, did Ron have a his own ramp or a quarter or anything? No. No. Well, Ron. Gosh, yeah, Ron didn't have that either. But he would go to places like he knew some people that had ramps. So oh, okay. He'd take me there sometimes. So he'd just mission out, yeah. Mm. 
So at this point in, in BMX, BMX is kind of dead, right? I guess so, but I mean, I didn't know better, you know. Oh, you just you you didn't have any idea what was going on outside that. So. Yeah, I mean, I just was so happy to ride. I guess I, just one more thing. I was thinking of Ron real quick. Is like I had this kind of not great situation with a stepdad, and Ron would like. I mean, he would basically just like drag me out of there and like take me away. Oh, really? Like it was a pretty rough scene, and he would like just take care of me. He was like one of my early BMX dads. Oh, amazing. Even though he's only a little older than me. What is he, like a year or two older than you or something? I think three. Oh, okay. Or like he was three years ahead of me in school. All anyway. oh, right. Well, that's cool. Huh? Yeah. I didn't, didn't know that, yeah. <clears throat> he actually, I'm just going to keep talking about it. Yeah, he, go, go. So he took me uh, to Woodward when I was 16 too. And he had been, been teaching there. And he like got me a job in the bike shop and... I mean, going to Woodward was amazing, right? Yeah. I just rode with, this is the early days. Like they still had BMX racing there. Okay. And the BMX racing guy got fired. And so they made, I was the only person in there who had ever raced BMX. So they made me the BMX instructor. Oh, yeah. And I started actually getting paid. Like, and yeah, man, I spent like the next 13 summers going to Woodward. Oh, you, you went from there. You just kept going every year. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Well, what, so that was, I take it when, they had the half pipe there. Had the half the pipe. The two vert ramps. Yep. It was before, like, one of the vert ramps eventually got cut into the spine mini. Oh, okay. The big spine, it was still a vert ramp back then, like an eight foot mini, or eight foot vert ramp, and then a, the big vert ramp and dirt jumps. And that was about it. Like, yeah, there wasn't the much else. Yeah. yeah. Did you see any of them contests that they held there? No, nah, none of the old ones, no. Okay. They, they look fucking cool, yeah. Yeah. But it was those <laughs> ramps. Nice. Um, so yeah, what can you remember like, like advancing, like you're riding, like when, when you started getting sort of realizing that this was something that you was going to do more and you was going to sort of put more effort into it, like, and learn sort of more progressive tricks or did that just come naturally and you can't really. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's all I wanted to do is ride and push it and I couldn't think of anything else, but I, I guess the moment where I started like. You know, Albies put me on their flow team, which meant you got a free T-shirt and like a five percent discount or something. Okay. Like it was, but it was like a sponsor. Yeah, yeah. That's when I was pretty young, and then when I was seventeen, I think maybe just about turned eighteen. There was a jumping contest at a, at the NBL Grand Nationals in Louisville, and me and a friend went down there, and I entered the contest and ended up getting second behind Fuzzy. Oh wow! And uh. That was like, you know, crap. Like, yeah. Um, and you know, I got a photo in the magazine, and like, um, just you know, I was. I mean, I was always sure that's what all I wanted to do, but it seemed like I could actually do it around then. What was that? The Grizz photo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love that photo. Yeah. Yeah, that was a anomaly because BMX Plus back then would only run people in like full uniforms. Yeah. And I had like you know, literally hand sewn clothes that I had like trying to keep together and mismatched parts and yeah it was, it was a weird thing for them to run yeah that was a fucking cool photo i thought you yeah. know i looked at it actually like semi-recent and was like wondering where that was from so who did you beat in that contest can you remember no clue oh, okay. <laughs> but fuzzy was in it be interesting but i didn't be fuzzy. Know, yeah, yeah and uh so well, what bike can you remember what bike you was on i remember that one was a RevCore, which was some race brand and it wasn't a bike i picked it was just like a bike i found free at albies you know that oh, was okay. like a warranty or something it was literally anything that could keep going. Mismatched pedals, mismatched grips, everything was bent, broken, two different tires, wheels, you know. Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, and from from there, did you like what was like the next step? Like, because we I remember over here we this is probably like going forward a little bit. We we had this video and it was Jay Miron doing a GT show and you was it. This was the first time I saw you riding. Oh, I forgot. And you was that. in this with an all, I think it was an all black bike, which looked like a standard, but it might've just been something sprayed. And there was a little blue spine and you was doing towel whips and X down freeze. And I'd never seen like really? X down freeze. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, with a, with a, it seemed to look like the same helmet as in that Grizz photo. Yeah. Well, it been, so this, this is a huge moment for me, which I, kind of just forgot about it, just remembered. Um, 
GT was doing shows. Miron was GT team and Volker got hurt and they needed someone to finish out like the last three days of shows. And they were in Michigan. They called the Albies. They recommended me and I went on uh, and GT gave me a bike to ride in it. Okay. Which I literally folded in two hours. Like it just <laughs> buckled. So I just, I warrantied this frame. They just gave me to Albies and got at Holmes and painted it all. Black. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. yeah it looked big. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went on with Jay and I mean, Jay was, you know, Jay was Jay Mary. He's just like yeah. a superhero. Um, he was doing the, we had a spine ramp. I think it's all we had is a spine ramp and he would do this, the jump stuff on the ramp. And then he would like rip off his pads and do flat land. And then I would do my thing. And then he would come back and like finish it off with like big tricks. Uh, and on that trip, Jay did the first backflip ever over a spine in a mall right. on like slippery four. Uh, uh, and he also did 360 tail lips. This is really oh, early. Oh, that's early, yeah. Before I'd ever heard anyone do them, but he was doing like fly out, but he was pulling them. Yeah. And it was just Jay. It was just amazing. But, but yeah. But you could already do a towel whip, like. I don't know, if you say so. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. From either. what I remember, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'll be able to source this footage. I bet somewhere. I didn't pull it. I bet I landed one footed and dragged a foot, but I probably was trying it. <laughs> yeah, it would look, yeah, from where, I, from how I remember it, I haven't seen it for years and years, but I remember it. Because I, I remember it's so distinct, the, you know, the way that you do it. And I remember that it was actually my friend Dave Beveridge, rest in peace, was the guy that lent me the tape. And uh, and I remember seeing it and thinking, fuck, who the fuck's this guy? Because hmm. it was so distinct, you know, like everything was distinct. And the, the 360s, like X in into it and not, you know, the other way was like, I remember that as well. So, that yeah, the two like quite progressive moves for me I'm, when I'm looking and thinking, there's Jerry Miron, who's the other guy. Interesting to know that you did GT shows, yeah. Yeah, I did a few. Which is how that come about. After that, that's when I went, and I don't remember the exact sequence, but I went to Rampage around then, and like I was got sponsored by Standard. Oh, okay. I never actually had a, my own Standard bike, but I like lived out there for a while, like a few months, like in the Standard house or in the skate park, and rode Rampage every day. Was that Rampage in the bowling alley or the other one? The other one. They'd moved to the new one. Okay. Um, which I hated, by the way. Like, hit my head on the ceiling all the time. Oh, all like, right. I felt like I couldn't ride in there. It's, but there was a good spy mini. I learned a lot of spy mini, like mini ramp tricks, which was the thing back then. Um, yeah. So at, at that time, we already started talking about doing a signature bike. Okay. And that was going to be a jumping bike because there was no jumping bikes. Standard only had freestyle bikes with like the yeah, standing right, platforms yeah. and really short front ends. And that was like what the STA was going to be. It wasn't the TAJ. Okay. But, uh, I quit the team right before it came out and yeah, just went down to Austin. What? Well he was on, on the video though before that, right? Yeah, there was. I was, was in a that couple fat of years. ones, was it? Not fat ones. It was uh, like Roger's Garage. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Really old. That, that, but that was quite a good part for it as well at the time. So. Yeah, I remember. I was starting to get the hang of things around then. But you can't remember like who who did you watch to make you want to learn tower whips? I was quite interested in that, how you, how different they were, like who where you got the idea for for it. I don't know. It's just the way I did it. I mean, I never really thought about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You didn't even realize you were kicking it the the sort of the other way, no? No, I didn't. You just no. like this feels like the way to do it. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have an answer. There's no. It's just the way I felt. Right. Yeah, it's just uh, whose riding was you looking at though to uh, for sort of back then. I mean, it was Hoffman. It was always Hoffman, like around then. Like he was just on fire. Yeah. Progressive, you know, like everything he did was new and yeah. groundbreaking. And, um, yeah, I mean, like back then, I'd go to a freestyle or I'd go to a contest and I'd be the only one on a race bike. Yeah. You know, the Holmes was a race bike with only a back brake and no pegs or two pegs. Yeah. It was just unheard of back then. Like I was total weirdo yeah that's what, what else i was going to ask you is like you you'd, when you was riding the standard you was completely not in the standard mold of the other riders at that point in time yeah i was on a holmes the whole time they they like 
lent me a frame that I used for like a couple weeks once, a lengthy. But yeah. The, but I hated it. It was too short for me. Um, I, I think if, if I remember right, Rick actually had to buy an S and M Holmes from Moeller for me, oh, okay. which was probably pretty painful for him. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it. <laughs> <clears throat> and even like the, the riding was was completely different to the rest of the standard guys because those guys at that point was all like mega tech, you know, like yeah, front but, brakes and coaster brakes. Yeah. And what, what happened there? What, how come did you just quit standard? Uh, I had a pretty big falling out with Rick, um, and I mean, I just had to get out of there. Yeah, like, I just. So this is when you was living at the standard house. Yeah, it was pretty in intimidating for me. Like he was still the pro, you yeah. know. Like you and I just like it's actually a moment I'm kind of proud of because I really stood up for something that I thought was really wrong, and I had to like that's it. I just have to go. You know? Yeah, no idea what I'm gonna do, and and it was gnarly. Like he was shouting shit at me, like I made you who you are, and how dare you, and you know, like but I had to get out of there. Yeah. So I did. I went to uh, the contest. That, right after that was a scrap contest in Chicago. Okay. Went there, rode, um, and I kind of met the Hoffman guys. And like they had their whole crew. They would drive up from Oklahoma. It's a long drive, like 15 hours. And they invited me to like convoy with them down from, from the contest. And I did. And actually, I had a beautiful moment that I really cherish in memory where Late at night, driving the, the Mike, the boy Akobach was with me, but we'd been driving all night. It's like three in the morning, and I think Chuck D, from Hoffman Bikes, was like, "Why don't you take a break? I'll drive your car. Hop in the van. Hop in the van." And Matt's driving, and I'm in the passenger seat. Everyone else in the back of the van just knocked out. Me and Matt had this like long three in the morning road trip talk. Yeah, and I never talked to Matt before. Like it was cool. He invited me right there to like join the team. I stayed in Oklahoma a bit. He gave me a bike, but I couldn't really ride it, and it was still cold. What was that, a Condor? Condor, yeah. Okay. It was still cold there, like in Oklahoma City. So I drove further south at an Ant in Dallas, which was like three hours south, still cold, and I just drove to Austin. I heard that there were some bike riders there, and that's how I ended up in Austin. All right. Oh, wow. Early, early, early days, yeah. Yeah. Who, who was the bike riders that you went to see in Austin? Well, I met Sheps at uh, Scrap and like possibly Guten, Ruben Castillo. They were up there. I knew those guys were down there. Okay. And just sort of like showed up at Nice Street, which was already there, you know. And that was just like at that point in time, some undeveloped trails. Yeah, I mean, it was. Or it developed to that point in time. But. Yeah, it was like three jumps. There was the first set, second set, third set. Oh, Maybe wow. it was the fourth set. It was like. You know, I think the force that was like you just pedaled straight at one jump, and the other two were like it was yeah, it's quite small. Okay. Uh, and I showed up there, you know, five dollars a jar of peanut butter and a bag of popcorn. That's I remember like it was tight. Yeah. I had nothing, and like I had a cousin there let me crash on his floor, and like uh, got a job at a grocery store and started living in Austin. Wow. Amazing. <clears throat> so before that, you was going to ride for family bikes. Sheps invited me to ride for family. I had this weird thing where I was so bummed out about the standard thing. I didn't want to like jump on another team. Straight Hoffman, away. Hoffman invited me to, you know. And um, yeah, at this point, I tried the Condor, couldn't ride it, or didn't feel comfortable. Um, and then Sheps was like starting this company, Family Bikes, which really never happened yeah but uh there was a lot like seven or eight months where i rode for family all right you know in the or not well, that was after you was going to ride for hoffman or i turned matt down oh wow um because i just didn't like the bike and i just i felt also there's this weird part of me that felt like riding for hoffman was gonna be a big commitment like it was gonna and i just wasn't ready to do that i felt like sounds like a, like a relationship but i felt like I was so burned on the standard thing that I just didn't want to like make any promises to anyone else that I couldn't keep, you know? Oh, okay. So I just tried the family thing and it was cool because I felt really independent. There was nothing I had to ride or like just rode whatever I wanted. The chef's bought me a Holmes. 
Oh, from the molar, <laughs> like everybody did. And yeah, and then after that, I eventually did ride for Hoffman. All right, because the family bikes thing, I, I don't think there was anything more than an advert, but it was definitely like a cool concept. So I remember seeing it and being like, "Well, this is fucking." Yeah, I mean, it was coming off of homeless, wasn't they? I assume most people listening to this are like old school aficionados, but it, it was yeah, it was like basically a homeless was dead, homeless bikes yeah. was dead, and this was kind of like Shep's next project. Yeah. He actually had Matt make some forks. I think he couldn't afford to pay for them or something. So Matt just branded him Hoffman forks or something like that. So then how did you end up going back to Hoffman? Uh, It must have been, you know, we would go up to, this is about time the Oklahoma BS contests were starting and uh, which Ian would have been at living under a ramp. Um, And I mean, I think it was a pretty open invitation. Like Matt was like, well, if you oh, want to nice. do it. And also I was starting to ride vert and they needed someone for shows. Okay. So I pretty much, I, I don't remember how it happened. I, th- I think I might've called him, but or went up there, but whatever the case was, I mean, it was pretty much like when I was ready, he was welcoming to me. Oh, nice. Kind of. So I didn't know you started riding vert this, this early. I thought that came later, but yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I started doing shows for Matt, like, I've been riding vert a little bit actually before this, but like I had this really rad breakthrough around 90, it would have been 92 where I was, I could go like three or four feet and a friend, Brett Huntsinger, who had a vert ramp and it was really good. And he'd take me out there and all of a sudden it just clicked one day and I could go like eight feet. You know? oh, okay. So it's kind of like three or four feet is kind of a hard spot to be. You're not, you can't really hang over the deck but you need to. Yeah. And when you go a little higher, it all starts clicking. But that's all I could do is I could kind of go sort of high sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, then uh, Matt, yeah, Matt brought me on to do shows. So you, you wrote them shows that take you on a Holmes at that point in time? Yeah. Matt bought me a Holmes. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's no joke. Every Everybody bought me. He bought me a couple. Uh, and, uh, so GT bought me a Holmes, Standard bought me a Holmes, Chef's bought me a Holmes, Matt bought me a Holmes. I'm sure Albie's bought me a few. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, and like, Chris would give them to me too, but I I always I wouldn't I wouldn't like ask him to give me one if I was gonna like ride for another company. That, that's what I, I was always wondered if you rode for S and M at one point, but you didn't officially ride for S. No, I never did. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, so how did the like the Taj frame come about? Because Same that, that thing. was like the frame at one point. Well, we needed a jumping frame. I didn't like trims they had. Matt was starting to make his own bikes, so it was all perfect. You know, like, yeah. If you come on, we'll do, make a bike for you. And like you know, dirt jumping was a thing. Yeah, it was starting it was, to become a thing. It was and so not like making a jumping frame uh, instead of like a vert bike was made sense. Yeah. And what, what was that? Uh, I take it that was a mix of a Holmes and something else. Then that bike. Yeah, it was pretty similar to a Holmes. I think the back end was a little shorter. So it was still massive by today's standards, but you know, big sparkets. Um, and really just strong. Like I, it did, you know, I had helped kind of design the STA. So yeah. it was kind of like same thing. Like we wanted to do a big down tube and wishbones and like heavy, you know, big, big diameter tubing. We didn't really know how to make it stronger. We just figured bigger and thicker. Yeah, Most rugged. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I remember that frame being like really popular at one point. So that was you chose the geometry for that frame. Yeah, yeah. And and the way it was, the way it looked. Yeah. So me and Chris Gack. Chris Gack was like the shop <laughs> foreman, or you know, he was working there at the time when they were making bikes at HP. And he and I sat down and like I knew what I wanted, and he was able to kind of draw it and make okay. it work. And, yeah, the, the, like the wishbone, right? The kind of yeah, yeah, and the bottom one was quite distinct as well, wasn't it? It was all like very sort of. Yeah. It was. It didn't look like any of the other bikes at the time, and it was like, and, and the graphics and everything was was cool. I thought, yeah, it had a definite like new vibe to it. Yeah. So these are, I, I've been told now that for by collectors, these are the ramp room Taj bikes, and there was only a few hundred of them, I guess. But, well, made by like, by Hoffman guys yeah, in the in actual USA. Ramp. Yeah, and it was like pretty gritty like construction like the down tubes ovalized and they ovalized by putting on a table and pressing it so it just kind of ovalized oh really and that's how they did it you know oh wow you know how many they make 
I, I, I was told it was somewhere around 200 or something. Oh, no, yeah, quite not a few, yeah. <clears throat> and then, like, so from there, you're, like, you're riding sprocket jockey shows. Fuck, yeah, that was a crazy time. Like, I just got thrown into these shows with the best riders in the entire world. Dave Mira, Jay Miron, Matt Hoffman, Dennis McCoy, Taj. Go for it. <laughs> like, it was insane. And, like, they were so good. And... Uh, and what was the setup? The, the half pipe and a jump box? Or? Yeah, half pipe and a box. Okay. Uh, and uh, did a few on like the really old trailer they had that was really dangerous, like really high off the ground. It had these like jack handles that if you fell off the ramp, you'd get impaled on. And then for a while, there was a portable wooden one. It wasn't really portable that we had to like basically rebuild everywhere before we had like the really nice trailer that he had later. Okay. But we would go to like fairs and county fairs, state fairs, and do shows, and some pretty rough places. Like, I mean, these fairs in the U.S. probably, it's, it's kind of a generalization, but it's like all ex-cons working there, like rough people, rough crowd, like, but we just rode bikes. And, yeah. Um, oh, it was amazing. I can't even imagine some, I can't even believe some of the stuff that I would see, especially Matt. Like, he would, you know, Matt started these shows, you know, he made some money, of course, but it was like he wanted to spread BMX around. Yeah. And so his idea was, I'm going to ride as hard as I can every single show. I don't care if there's four people in the crowd. And it would be that way. Sunday morning at 9 a.m. There's like four people there. And Matt is doing 900s and shit. Like, it was insane. Yeah. And it would inspire everyone else on the deck. Like, if he's doing a 900, you got to, like, try your hardest, too, you know? 900 fresh out of bed, yeah. Like, no lie. Like, it was like that. Every time Matt rode. And then, yeah, I mean, Mira got hurt. He blew up his spleen. So I kind of took his spot over. And, you know, now I have to do, like, a best trick part of the thing. And oh, okay. No idea what to do. You know, I'm just learning on the fly. And was that was that like a tour? Or you just used to drive out for, for a weekend of shows and then come back? A little bit of both. Like, sometimes I'd get called up. But... I think it was a tour mostly where we were like, I can't remember, but like Florida and Alabama, oh, okay. and Texas, Oklahoma kind of thing. And it was long and I actually eventually really disliked doing shows because I felt really robotic doing them, but I quit my job. Yeah. I just rode bikes full time. I mean, made like a hundred bucks a show or something, you know, or 75 bucks. It was meager, but it was plenty to live yeah. on. And where you was living in austin or did you live in oklahoma at any i was point? in austin yeah okay. and, uh, i stayed in oklahoma you know on and off but never lived there okay <clears throat> and you, you rode for airwalk as well at that point in time yeah um so how did i get i got an airwalk through albies like way back like a co-sponsor deal where they give me a set of shoes like through like a local rep and then it turned into kim boyle came around and like actually started getting paid there's a whole se series, gosh, I don't remember where this fits in, but I started, I went on tour with like Alan Foster and Brian Foster when they start, when they're starting to be like race jumps at racing contests, oh, okay, yeah. ju jumping contests at races. And I remember that being really cool because Alan and Brian are awesome. And like Brian and Alan both double A pro racers, like badasses. And I'd kind of like get to see that whole world and I knew all the drama and the points and everything. Yeah. But I didn't have to do anything except hit the jump a few times at the end of the day. Yeah. That was that was a cool time. Um, and what was it? Can you remember what the Airwalk deal was? Like what I got paid? Well, not what you got paid. Like what, what kind of like, what the benefits were? Like they flew you places or like they got you a travel budget or? Oh, no. This is like, I mean, this is, I think I got like 200 bucks a month. This is like, this like NTS days or something. Was it that show? Yeah. Before then. Oh, it was before? Well before then, yeah. Okay, so it wasn't even. Planned. When the NTSs came out, I was like, they were like cool. Like it was like, I don't know what I was wearing. Like high, it was like early, like high top days. Like okay. the big boots, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, like the 6,000 Fahrenheit. So whatever one of those, those are, yeah. crazy ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was on early, like really early. Yeah, I mean, so I was on in like 1990 or something. Oh, wow. I didn't know he started then. Um, this is like kind of the co-sponsor deal. And yeah. I don't remember why I started getting paid. But I do remember uh, I was on Hoffman and then like Box came around. Those really good oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And they were terrible. And they were paying everyone on Hoffman money and, and like 
I just, I'm not wearing those stupid things, you know, <laughs> I, but I got a call from Airwalk. Like, Hey, we know box is going to offer you money. We want to keep you. We'll match what they're going to pay you. We heard, we heard they're going to pay you $1,500. So I'm like, cool. <laughs> and so I was, I went from like 200 to like $1,500 a month oh, oh. and I could like live, you know, like yeah. I was like chilling. Um, and around then Airwalk would make me like custom canvas shoes. They didn't have like a vegan shoe, Okay. but I didn't want to wear leather. And so they made me have like 12 or 15 pair of a certain shoe oh, in canvas. Was, was, was that the Airwalk one? So, <sighs> no, it wasn't that. It was a decent shoe, but I think it was just some like random skate shoe they just made in canvas for me. I think I remember. Was it the, like the circular eye on the side? I don't think so. No, I those are the ones. Set it yeah, I did some like, of those. Yeah. These were like just blue canvas, gum sole, and I don't even remember a logo on there. So I had those. Yeah, I had those in like '95 because I remember I had them in Bethlehem. Okay. And, um, we're getting ahead a little bit, but. So the airwalk thing was was real cool at one point. Like if you if that was giving you that's a lot of money for back then, right? That's yeah, like, they, they flew me to like to Australia once. Um, but mostly back then, it was still kind of Hoffman taking care of me. Yeah. Um, and I got burned out on the shows. I distinctly remember being on the shows and like, you kind of have to do this high level riding every day, but you're pushing it. And I'm and I'm like learning, so I'm getting beat up, like bruised. And like I remember like having a really bad heel bruise, and I didn't want to do another show. So I would like kind of half ass it, like I could. This is what I vividly remember. I could do tail whips. That was like my only big trick. I could do tail whips one way that was really easy and pull it every time, but it felt lame. Or I could do it the way that felt good and maybe pull it not all the time. And that because I was hurt, I was doing it the easy way. And it started to just feel really robotic. I'm like, so what was the easy way? Around the top? In the same way, just like tighter and like quicker. And I'd catch it like way early. Okay. Like plenty of time to like land smooth instead of like hanging it out there and i don't know it's just a feeling thing i don't know if they even look different but it was a feeling thing okay so when you that was like the classic like downside whip i guess right there you learned that during them shows because you're riding vert with those progressive guys i guess yeah i mean i, I remember riding the vert ramp like in between shows when no one was around and like just trying to figure it out by myself and like basically just got it to work yeah because you know? that, that i don't think that had been done before until you you did that one yeah yeah i mean it was always done over the top like conventional like adam Benz, i guess did it but i had never seen it okay you know? so i i like I mean, as far as i know i figured it out on my own yeah you know? um and it was a kind of it was a cool breakthrough like to yeah, make yeah. that work you know oh, that I remember, was a totally different kind of feeling oh, i remember seeing it on video and then uh, you, you did one at Backyard when you came here one year, and mm -hmm. it was like one of the, the highlights of like when, when we for our, our crew is one of the highlights without a doubt. Well, I quit doing shows because of that. Like, I'm like, sorry, Matt, can't do it. Like, and this is my income, but it's just hurting my riding. You know? Yeah. Uh, and that was really early on, like just this moment of like, I'm going to keep riding for me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to ruin it for risk ruining it for any anything else you know yeah uh, was he, he was cool i'll take it right matt was always incredibly supportive like he wanted me to do the shows but he like understood yeah mm. nice yeah <clears throat> so then you stopped doing the shows and what you moved back to austin at that point yeah i mean, was it uh, austin was home but i had been traveling like loads probably about that time i moved up to bethlehem to ride posh oh okay this is like 95 or so. Um, that sounds about right. I lived in Bethlehem technically for like a year and a half, but I was still traveling loads. So I wasn't really there, but I did have a, like a good summer of riding posh, like all the time. Was, was that face value sort of days? Early posh. Anthem. And face value was pre anthem, right? You had stuff in. Is there posh and face value? Yeah. Well, but it's like, probably. it's different though. It looks very different to, mm -hmm. to the Anthem one. Yeah. Well, Anthem, it was one, Anthem when I was living there too. Anthem was like kind of filmed right when I was leaving there. Possibly maybe it wasn't finished till after I had moved away, but that was like, yeah, that, that was those days. Okay. So I wanted to speak to you about the UGP thing. How did you end up on, on UGP? 
good question. Was that might be the rice? Yeah. They, so yes, right? I was. Yeah, uh, Ronnie UGP put on the dirt jump comps. Oh, okay. There you go. Like uh, the flying circus, they were called. All right. And uh, met him through there, and he started hooking me up with stuff. Like early on, this would have been man, ninety three, four. Okay. Yeah. So I think you you had a UGP plate on as well at some point, maybe. Could be. Yeah. The, there were some jump comps where you had to have a number plate. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then that video, face value, when you, you had that, that final part in that, that was like, a, to me, that was a, a game changer. Like, things changed. But, you know, there's like certain videos and certain pictures that, that come out in, in BMX and you're like, oh, things have changed now. This has become something different. So that part, to me, was like, this is how bike riding is now. <laughs> and it was like, a, yeah, the page had been turned. So that was a fucking awesome part. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because that was uh, definitely a, a huge standout part for that point in time. I think it was 96, maybe. That's cool to hear. I, yeah, I mean, I know. So the, the route, like you had the big rail at the start, which was one of the biggest rails I'd seen, I think, on a BMX at the time. Oh, yeah. And then you had that huge gap at the end where you like, hop on the and then all the stuff in the middle as well it was like all it was just a, a completely like different look on riding for me i remember i always remember on that first rail it was like on a elevated deck and we were kind of worried i might like flip over and like it was a long drop pete augustine if you watched it he's on there and he kind of comes running into frame and like tries to catch me Worried I'm going to flip over the rail. Oh, okay. At the end. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it was Pete. I mean, Pete was kind of, Pete's awesome. Pete was kind of around like, and Pete Augustine was a legend. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. And he was like, kind of like, I don't know, rooting me on, you know. I can remember him being like, you can do stuff no one else can do. Just do oh, it. <laughs> like, it was cool. I don't remember a whole lot of how we filmed it. Uh, I think I, you know, it was the old days. So like, yeah, it wasn't like probably even really realized I was filming for a video. It's just like, just go film stuff. Oh, okay. you know? And like, uh, I'd go to Florida for contests and, you know, Ronnie would bring me down there and we'd film. And was it all filmed by Kip Williamson? Or was there other filmers for that? I mean, it was definitely Kip's video. I can't remember if some of the clips were from someone else, but mostly it was Kip for okay. sure. Okay. And there was the good Woodward stuff as well. Oh yeah. With a like big huge alley wall ride and like the there was loads of like flying about a woodward all kinds of over the spine big airs on the oh, yeah, on yeah. the spine ramp and big freeze and yeah I can't remember if that was all Kip filming but yeah the, yeah I remember I remember that stuff. Can you remember that filming for that part thinking like this is going to be a good part or you can't even remember it? You know, I mean, all my video parts I I was never. I'd hear my friends be really conscious that they were making a video part and it was going to last and I just never really could do that. I just tried to ride how I could that day. And I, and I always wish like, man, I wish I did something big. Cause I know, you know, like something you're scared of, like they'd seem to like find power and like, this is on a video. I got to like really push it. And I, I just never could do that. I just sort of rode as good as I could that day. Well, it doesn't come across that way. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, Yeah, um, the, the sort of along the same lines. Like the, the trick selection that you use when you when you ride is like very sort of ungimmicky and very BMX. Like it's it's just conventional like BMX, but like done how I think it should be done anyway. But is that like a a conscious effort? Is that just natural? That's just how you think it is. That's just what comes out when you ride. Uh. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, like you know, one footed X up toboggan and like a like alley oop wall ride over the gap, and like it just all seems like it's just pure BMX riding. But that's it is. I mean, but it all is, I guess. But it's, I mean, for me, it was feeling. You know, like they could show me the clip, it could look cool, and like didn't feel good. Yeah, gotta do it again. And like, and by feeling, I mean more than just like I landed smooth. It's more like. He, you know, when you're doing something on a bike, you can like, like do a tabletop, right? Like you could probably get your bike kind of flat and it's tabletop 
or you can do the ones that like really crank and maybe it's not even any flatter, but it felt like you heard a guitar solo. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, it was okay, like, yeah. yeah, someone's bending a guitar string. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that it's like putting emotion and yourself into it more so than the mechanics. And so that's what I, how I tried to ride. Like, and I was aware of that even back then. It was just like that feeling and like doing what, I don't know, like I could put something into it more so than just pulling the trick. Yeah. It's not, yeah, no, it's, that's what I mean. It's like not, it's unrobotic. Like it's not a, you know, folding up the paper, like, and it's, 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 it's feeling. That's what, that's what was kind of, what was, what I was getting at. Yeah. Um, and then like, so you, you ride in for Hoffman and you, you end up at the backyard jam, right? In the UK. Yeah. That was the first time you've been to the UK. Yeah. So Mr. Morris and I were talking about that today. Um, I'm pretty sure Hoffman sent me over. They backyard might've helped pay for it or maybe they did pay for it, but it was kind of through Hoffman. I just got on the team. Yeah. The first like international trip land in London. Don't know anybody. Obviously don't have a phone. Luckily Ian was there to pick me up and, uh, yeah, I was here. How was that? Good experience. Yeah. I remember it being awesome and just weird, you know, like you're so new to traveling, never been to another country and here you are. I don't know. It was yeah. fun. We were trying to figure out what year it was. I think it was 95. 95. 95 that was. You came back in 97. 96. 97. Okay. Yeah. So ninety, you because you was here in ninety five because it was the same year Stuart King rode. Yeah, you would have known Stuart King at that point, right? Because he'd been to Bethlehem as well. I think, yeah, and he'd been to the Oklahoma contests. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think guess you so. knew him. Yeah, and that was that year, wasn't it? Yeah, and you had the blue targe, and it was yeah, it was the. Didn't I remember, and then you you the chasm. Yeah, you? you went back and tried to jump the chasm right? on the Tuesday after the yeah. event. They tell with the chasm. Did I tell with it? I think did you, did you I think I wanted to, but I think I've I, seen yeah. footage of you trying to jump that chasm. Definitely. Oh, I thought. Well, I remember. I do remember in the contest, like chasm, to, chasm, 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 chasm. Anyway, it was that time, you know, and it was just madness. Everybody running over there. I asked some kid, and he's like, "I'm like, how fast?" He goes, "Go as fast as you can possibly go," and I did. And I remember jumping and seeing the landing just go by and it's just nothing and I landed and my bars just went Arr! and that was it like I was done and then we went back yeah I think all I ever did is at X up I think I wanted to do a yeah, bit but I, I just think, did it yeah, X up yeah, right. and maybe I wrecked my bike again or something but and that was just like on the Tuesday there's no one there that was the tabletop metal takeoff wasn't it yeah, yeah. and the one handed tail with and the 360 tape, one-handed 360 Yeah, one-handed 360 yeah, table, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was awesome. I loved those events. They were just so bananas. And then the 97 one was the swamp. Yeah, it was the two the, jumps. Two jumps. In the field. In the field. Yeah. And the vert. And the vert. That's oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we couldn't figure out, because we were at Glying Gap today, and we couldn't, uh, there's a vert, we had a vert ramp there, didn't we? But yeah. Matt did the demo in the rain. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That was ninety six. So that was ninety six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's it. Piece it together. <clears throat> yeah. That the the vert was the one with the, the downside whip that I was on about. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The slow, the slow one. Yeah. The, the sort of iconic yeah. Mark Noble photo. Yeah. Red Hoffman with a red jersey. jersey. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then, yeah, how was that coming back again for the the next one? You were still on Hoffman, right? Yeah, it was great. I mean. I instantly felt really at home in Hastings and it was cool to go back there just yesterday and like just yeah I mean, it seems like you ended up there a bunch you know through the years yeah because uh, then there was another one wasn't there you ended up on the the big alley wall ride on the on the one in 2002 or whatever it was can you remember that yeah yeah but I think yeah. I think I went to Hastings even more than that yeah yeah I think of course it was like yeah, just the bike base. shows and stuff yeah, yeah. but we did 70s tours didn't we mm. and you went to Europe a couple of times to Marseille yeah yeah we'd start from Hastings yeah 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 totally yeah yeah Cologne, it was a, and I think we might have gone to 
Cold in Cologne as well and gone down. Yeah, we did so many trips. Yeah. I can't really remember all of them. It, I, I very much remember that I was just really taken care of and everyone was super friendly because I was, you know, really nervous. Yeah. And then everyone was really good to me. And you came on your own the first time you came as well. Oh, amazing. Yeah, Matt was hurt or something. We were riding along the sea from this morning and I was trying to figure out where Backyard used to be. Okay. And then I was, remember we were talking about Taz walking around Hastings with a rim, a pair of 48 rim around his neck, <laughs> trying to sell it because it was worth a, it was here to worth, worth a lot of money over here back then. So I have had a strict policy in my whole riding career that if someone gives me something, I just give it away. I don't sell it unless. I like literally can't eat and I was like at that point and someone somehow I got a Peregrine 48 rim which was so hard to get it was gold hmm. and someone told me I could sell it for a lot of money in England so yeah walked around the stupid rim on my neck for like an entire week and hoping to sell it so you didn't get rid of it huh I must have got rid of it at some point but like I was probably asking like way too much money for it I didn't understand pounds you know <laughs> <laughs> that's quite an old rim as well at that point in time wasn't it yeah, they were still hard to get. Yeah. Um, Peregrine, like no, no, they never really sponsored anybody, and it was like ninety five. They were still. That was like. Were they still kind of, kicking? Were they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Alex Rims didn't come until oh yeah, yeah, later, way later, the yeah, the double yeah. wall. Yeah, Alex Rims. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I do remember I tried to sell stickers too and I was trying to sell them for some stupid amount. Like I didn't know it was like offensively amount high, but then at the end. I like started handing them out for kids to fill up garbage bags to help clean up. Uh, yeah. And I, I like got a whole bunch of bags of garbage for you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Needed it. So, did you ever ride Rob? I don't think so. Okay. Well, weird, huh? Yeah, I don't know why yeah. I didn't go there. I don't think I've ever been there now. I know, I know I haven't. Or if I have, I wasn't able to ride or something. Interesting. And so, we did we go any? Did we go up to Liverpool or anything like that? Or there was a we went to Livingston. Like, Livingston, yeah. Um, but I can't really. The, I can't really remember the what we were doing there, except eating a lot of snacks. That too. So that's about right. What? Um, how did Airwalk come to an end? Can you remember? Yeah, not really. I mean, Eddie's, it, obviously Eddie's came in, but I can't remember if Airwalk, I think Airwalk, I don't remember if Airwalk was just sort of petering out or mm. Eddie's was just better. I think they just, didn't they go out of business or something? Or they got taken I mean, I think I went straight from Airwalk to Eddie's. Like, I quit Airwalk to mm -hmm. go to Eddie's. But I, I think Air, Eddie's was just, like, cooler, you know? It's just, like, better shoes. And yeah. Just, Airwalk shoes were pretty poor, you know? Um, and they, they were talking about doing a signature shoe with me because they had done the Foster Brothers shoes. Okay. And it was. Yeah. All oh, right. And it was kind of like not happening. It had been going on for a year or two. And then Eddie sort of said, we'll do a signature shoe with you. And so I was like, cool, I'll do it. I bet, so that was one of the sort of the start of Etnies was that was one of the first things they, they were saying. They're going to do signature BMX shoes. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And how did you end up on there? Was that a rooftop thing? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was rooftop and called me and pitched it. And nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Like that, I mean, Eddie's was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and how did that, like, what was the process of getting, how long was it between when you joined to that shoe coming out? Like a year or two? Uh, well, longer, right? It was longer than that. Was it? I, I don't remember. I, actually, I honestly don't remember. I don't think it was. I don't think it was more than a year, but I could easily be completely wrong. It maybe because actually, uh, at this point, I'm like it's pretty strict. Won't wear leather, and they so they were giving me like S shoes. Okay. Um, Muska shoes. Those are really massive. Yeah, yeah. But they were they were vegan. Yeah. Um, and I rode in those for quite a while, because pre like Mike V shoes, those were also non leather. And then our shoes came out. So, yeah, it could have been a year, year and a half. Yeah. And when did they come out? 99? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. That's why I thought it was like a little while. Because in 97, you were still on Airwalk when you came over to the backyard. Oh, time's out. Relatively, yeah. Right? yeah. 
And the, can you remember the process of like making that shoe? Because the, the original one was like a was a stock sole, wasn't it? I remember. Yeah, the original one we had, we had to use an outsole, like a the sole that already existed, and but then we kind of got to design the upper. Yeah, and it was like you know back then it was. I'm pretty sure I was faxing stuff to them, you know, yeah. like drawing on paper and, uh, but it was pretty cool. Like they basically did what I sent them, but the second and third shoes, I actually got to like do the whole thing. Like design oh, okay. the, the, the soul as well. So yeah. And I was like doing the drawings and everything. Like, I mean, they would do technical drawings from my drawings, but it was, they let me run wild. And because the, the first one was the first one and the second one were like really different, weren't they? As shoes, I remember yeah. it being like, well, when the second one, I was like, well, this is like nothing like the next, the one that came out previous. So we were really, I was really into. I think Joe was too, and Rooftop actually, all three of us. This third shoe, the second shoes, all had air pockets and heels. Yeah, right? air pockets and heels. You had to have air pockets. They didn't tell us that they made the shoe like 150 bucks. It just had to have it, and uh, so my shoe was almost like almost running shoe looking yeah that's what i thought yeah you yeah. had a scoop at the front and a scoop at the back was, yeah. was there like was you guys looking at like the mike v shoe because that was really popular and kind of like trying to figure out like how can i make it similar to that one or, or would you just because the first one was nothing like that one but then the next one i don't i don't remember i mean the mike v shoe was old by then to us um by the second shoe, you know. Yeah. I, I just thought it would be cool to have like a comfortable shoe that was a riding shoe. That was my logic. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I just remember that second shoe really being shocked at the price. Like they just never mentioned the price, so they just let me go. What was wild. it in the U.S.? Well, I remember over here and over here, it was like 150 bucks or something. It was, it was like unobtainable. Only probably once the conversion. It was yeah, it was like, 79, yeah. 79.95 was the, yeah. the problem because mm. we sell it cyclone. The shoes were in that bracket at that point anyway. Yeah. Because yeah. DCs, because we all came, yeah. everyone was looking at DCs at the time. Yeah. They? It, it wasn't an outrageous price no, like, no. for that point in time. Now it seems like it would be crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, back then it was like normal. Yeah. Yeah. For a hundred pounds. Well, yeah. Well, that one was kind of short lived. I think like, I think they switched to the third shoe pretty quickly. But uh, you know, it's pr it was pretty a big deal, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, it was a huge the, deal the, to it get. It was massive. Like to get three signature shoes in BMX down. <laughs> And the last one was the Foster Brothers shoes on Airwalk. Yeah. yeah. And this was like, okay, this is, it, it was massive, I think. Yeah, yeah, same, yeah. It, and, it, and it was, it, everything aligned. Like, for, yeah. for the Foster shoe, like, two good riders, good company, shoe wasn't good. No. Like, it just didn't no. look any good. No. But, so Etnies was like, good company, good riders, yeah. shoe looks good. It was like, everything was all all lined up and it and if the price was it, it wasn't a big deal back then no. i remember like we sold loads of those yeah. shoes yeah. do you remember so there's another signature shoe that's really forgotten about dennis mccoy had a signature shoe and i think it was through airwalk i think yeah i got it a vague was, recollection of this but what i remember about it was just it was just a monstrosity they made so few of them that they didn't make an actual mold to like stretch the upper over so they like just stuffed newspaper in there and they kind of formed because they were making like so few shoes and they would be all like misformed. Was it a high top <sighs> with like a wavy sort of pattern on the sole or something? It could be. I mean, this is such a vague memory, but I remember them being like pretty sad shoes. <laughs> but but Dennis had a shoe like yeah. before like, I any could, freestyler that I, I know of. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I even. I, I just remember an advert, I think, where he's, bailing at mission trials over the death jump and I'm, i think he's got some of them shoes on that was an airwalk walk ad that's what i mean yeah but yeah, in, that, in that ad, oh yeah but that, that, that was i think oh, okay. that was the shoe yeah oh, okay yeah. that's wild yeah i don't trust my memory on that but anyway yeah having a shoe having the shoes was awesome and it was really and the, really the program cool. they had seemed really cool as well like when they listened the riders were good to the riders because obviously image was good yeah like yeah. the company image was good the rider image was good everything mm. was like it, it just aligned that there was a good point in time yeah mm. 
<clears throat> and that was yeah. But, and the, they picked the right people, I think, as well, which which you, is rare. There's you know how much roughly how much molds are to make like to make an outsole, mm -hmm. and then it's super expensive because you got to make a left and a right, you got to make every single size. size yeah. So we did my second shoe, and the, again they let me draw everything, and I did one shoe, and they mirrored it on the other side, you know, for the bottom, of course. And when they mirrored it, this thing I had drawn was a fucking Nike swoosh, like, <laughs> almost perfectly. And then we were like, oh shoot! So I had to redraw it and I had to make new molds, like a second mold. So, so I kind of got four shoes. What shoe was that? That was a second shoe. Okay. If you remember, on the bottom there was like this like thing, but on the first round when it flipped over, it was a swoosh. And With because that shoe did that have a round yeah, like red, a Nike's red, logo? Red, yeah. yeah. And brown and going red, wasn't it? There was a bunch of different colors, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, so how did you, when you was designing the sole, did you have like a certain, this will work on a pedal and this won't? Like what, how did you come up with that? So, yeah, yeah. I had, well, vague theories, but I I did do the little circle thing that you kind of see in basketball shoes, like right where you pivot yeah, yeah. point. Okay. But I, in my mind, I pivoted on my pedals when I did tabletop. So I wanted a pivot point. Okay. And it, I mean, I think it's nonsense. Like, you know, it's just whatever the tread pattern is going to be fine. But like my idea was that it would pivot on that, like the ball of your like foot. Like the ball of your foot. Yeah. I've got one. Well, makes sense. Yeah. So I'm a strict, you got to ride on the ball of your foot. You can't be riding on the yeah, arch of your foot. Yeah. Not the same, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but what about like the actual, like the, all the rest of the shoe? Did you like figure that this grip is going to work better than something like, cause the grip that you used was always, well, not always, but on the second one, I looked at, I remember looking at that shoe thinking, oh, I wonder if that's going to grip. I never rode that shoe, but it was like the zigzag, right? Yeah. And I always wondered like how, how you would, was it, was I that, don't know. It made sense to me at the time. Yeah. But was, it, was it deep that zigzag or? It wasn't probably deep enough, but I remember thinking it was okay. Um, but I was probably pretty biased. And I mean, there was no science to it. It was just, yeah, that's, what I, was, that's what I was wondering. Like, if you'd used sort of certain shoe and been like, this zigzag works no, pretty well. This is the old days now. Like, I mean, it's not like they said, go buy some shoes and pick a tread you like. It was just like drawing on paper and okay. sent it to them. Because quite often, you, sometimes you get a shoe that you think is not, not going to be that great and it, you just, it works for you anyway. You know? And then what about the Roscoe? That was a different soul completely. That one was another, that? another soul. That one, that one was, I think, pretty dialed. Like, that was the best one of the, of the three, I, I would have said. Yeah. yeah. And that one, yeah, same thing, got to design it and got to make that one work. And by this point, they were starting to get into 3D printing, I believe. So they were actually able to take my drawings and 3D print little sections, and I could be like, yeah, that's right, or make oh, it deeper okay. and stuff. And so, uh, yeah, you had that one figured out a bit more. What, what was the sole on that one? Was that like tablet-shaped or something? Was Tablet-shaped. I don't like, remember. Like circles or something, like elongated? No. Nah. We'd have to look at it. I can't remember. Man. Okay. Just it had a circle in it too, though, like a pivot point yeah, circle. Yeah. No, the pivot, I, I quite like the idea of pivot point. I think it's because like the edge will go right there, the pivot point in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, that, that was a cool program. It needs, and then you... Yeah, yeah, sorry to get on, on the details. No, yeah, it's good. It was amazing. Like, it. like we did so much traveling, so much riding, awesome riders everywhere. It was great. Can you remember how how far after having the shoe they decided they were going to make that video or was that already being made <laughs> i don't remember it was a, it wasn't yet being made but um that was a long process of course yeah the video. i don't think it was that long no i don't think it i think it, maybe so, it was a lot of talking about it yeah it might yeah. have been talked about but I think, a, so if you got on in 98 you know, the video was out in 2002. So, so the shoes had come out at that point. So maybe two years, two and a half years of filming. It seemed a long time, didn't yeah. it? At that point in time. Mm -hmm. no, now it's... But yeah. It, but I think that was a video, one of the first videos that people went out there to think about. Yeah. Okay, we're filming for a video. Yeah. Whereas before... Like, just feel right. Like Face Valley was yeah. like, oh, he's got a camera. I'm going to do this. Let's get it on tape and submit the footage. This was like a thought yeah. process, I think. Yeah, I only got to film a little bit for that video, honestly, because 
I was, I had moved up to Olympia somewhere around there and I was kind of isolated up in my own little skate park. Uh, so we filmed a bunch there, but it was like three days, you know, Dave would come up for three days and we'd film. And then I'd see him again six months later or something, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, then I filmed a little, a few clips in Austin with Stu, uh, and some with Dave. Um, but yeah, it's weird. You have two years, but it was never like mm. filming every day. It was like every few months we'd film for a day, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah. That, uh, but yeah. it was a process because I remember we had to get Dave into a hotel room in Long Beach, didn't we? I flew out there. Yeah. Dave was like so stressed, so behind. I mean, it was like like he had to get out of the house you know it was like causing all kinds of family issues and so he just got a hotel and i flew out and stayed with him in his hotel room and for like two or three days and he would just work non-stop all night long and i'd like fall asleep and wake up and sit over his shoulder and try to help him and yeah it was a blurry mess getting that thing done wow i didn't, didn't know any of that yeah mm. what, what was was you look was you guiding him on the whole video, or just your part? No, no, not not just my part, but like I, whatever he was working on. Like, I mean, I was mostly there to like watch stuff and help him, and also like Dave's got his quirkiness. I remember at the time, and I was actually someone actually told me this might actually be true, but he like didn't really know how to use a computer very well, so he'd have a, a folder with a whole bunch of clips in it, and he needed to move them over to some other folder. And he'd sit there and grab one file and drag it over, and then there'd be a progress bar because the old days. Yeah. And then he'd grab another one, and I'm like Dave, just grab them all. He's like, no, 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 they'll get the the frames will get mixed up. I'm like, no, there's no way that you know. But like that was how he was working, so it was very, very slow. But that's how he works, you know. And, yeah. I mean, you can't second guess the magic he makes, but um. I, I was kind of there to like help him with that. And like, I tried to like help him when he'd fall asleep. I'd try to like organize folders and files. Cause it was all just very Guys. messy. You know? yeah. But, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I take no credit. I accept moral support. All I was doing yeah. was trying to keep him awake, keep him going and buy him a Coke for you you know, like <laughs> <laughs> drinking Coke. Yeah. Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then like what, that was really well received. That video, I thought. Mm. Everyone must have been pretty, pretty hyped on that when it came out. But I, I remember it was like a, there was a waiting game for it, and people were like, "When's it coming? When's it coming?" I actually, was on VHS when it when it first well, came out. Because it, it took a long time to when the video was done. It took a long time to come out, didn't it? On, the, on DVD. Oh, it was like a full year later before the DVD came out. Yeah. So it was VHS first, and then the DVD. And the DVD had like really good stuff on it. Like Edwin had a full rad part. That's in it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, uh, I mean, I remember being pretty st stoked on the stuff I'd filmed for it. Like I'd done a lot of stuff that I kind of. It was like the, the curve wall rides. I remember being a big standout yeah. at that point in time. That had really been. And there's a lot of stuff I'd kind of like, explored, made up, or like, yeah, like especially on the mini, like all the mini rep sprocket slide yeah. stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was pumped. Oh, and Eddie's like basically paid for the skate park I had up there that I filmed in. So oh, really? That was pretty rad, too. So that was your own skate park, yeah? Yeah, so I had this partner who had a little skate park in Tacoma named Min. Min? I hope it's Min. I feel really bad if I got that wrong. He was super cool. And so he agreed to like, I'm like, I'll build the park and pay for all the material, getting the park built. And you just run like he was going to have a bike shop in there. It was okay. just going to be his to run. And I was just going to like get the park built. And so I did that, you know, I had Wessel come out and skate light sponsored the skate light part and he's paid for the wood and we built it all and it was awesome. Yeah, it looked amazing. Yeah, but then the, you know the earthquake. There's an earthquake, and that building got condemned, and it never was able to open. But um, we filmed in there, and like we weren't even supposed to be in there. It was like closed. You know, we weren't allowed, but we filmed in there. Well, and then, how did you come up with all them like crank arm slides? Like before, it seemed like no one was really doing that 
and you seem to tap into that early on. So this is, I was riding at Mince Park. He said he had this little park in Tacoma, B&I Park, yeah. Uh, and it was it was really fun, but it had really low ceilings and it had a little spine mini. And I mean, you could like touch the ceiling. Yeah. So you couldn't really do errors, but I would just learn lip tricks and I decided I was going to learn something new. And I, the one thing that I thought you could, it was really lacking in bikes was stuff where you slid sideways. Okay. Everything was like... You know, yeah forward and so i decided i was going to figure this out and like it took a long time for me to figure out the balance point but it finally worked yeah and it was partially a product this is right when the first cassettes were coming in profile made a 13 tooth so you'd run a 36 13 and getting that big 45 tooth off the front allowed you enough room to do the trick although i do vividly remember garrett burns and van home would come to me like you can't do that trick on profile cranks. You can only do it on aluminum cranks with your little sprocket. And so I learned it on my race bike, which had profile cranks in a 45, just to prove them wrong. I don't know if I ever told them that, but I got it to work. But I broke a bunch of chains doing it. But um, yeah, that was so cool to me to finally slide sideways. Yeah, um, I remember a clip of you. I'm not sure. What, it might have just been in a props where you're like riding a like a sort of it looked like a, a bank to like wedge and you slid on that sideways mm. as well. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was in forward. I think like, it yeah, might've been in props too. Fucking, and I remember seeing it and I've not seen it. I'd see, obviously you did it on the spine a bunch, but then when you did it on that, like, I was like, Whoa. Okay. So I, the, this is for someone else to do, but I could I have done them on vert ramps. They work on vert. Um, but you get just, body slammed when it goes wrong like you can get into it on vert and you can slide and it's really really fast and uncontrollable and then you just get because no wheels touch right That's yeah no wheels touch no pedal no foot just just your crank arm and then you just get tomahawked but i did a few where i slid maybe you know five or six feet oh well but you could it feels like you could just rip across the whole ramp but it's so the balance point is so fine but i always wanted someone to learn that because it that would look so rad on vert so big you, air to just like you're sliding the opposite direction so yeah i mean for me it was opposite i turned crank I, arm and is it, my forward foot i turn into my forward foot so you land on your forward crank arm basically if that makes sense or yeah so left foot forward i turn left and just sort of like put that yeah left yeah that's it down. that's what i thought yeah and you're sliding a little bit on your chain as well and sprocket no or not you break your chain if you do it so you had to there was just a weird balance point like on the crank arm like i would step on my pedal and then i'd get off the pedal onto the crank arm and that's how it would work okay interesting oh here's another one this one's another one that i've always wanted someone else to figure out and i almost could figure out doing like lucky grinds on t1 ramp i could like tabletop my bike and it'd go into a crank slide but the only thing that's touching is the crank arm peg's not touching Bar's not touching. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, and you'd yeah. be sliding this like tabletop back. Used, yeah. It felt yeah. really cool. But and I did them, but I never like got them enough that we could film it or like get it consistent. But like it's there's a balance point there too. And how rad is it to do like a tabletop grind? Yeah. Because you, you were kind of eh, I don't well, know. you you did a few uh, uh, quite a few obscure things. I remember like that. Like for instance, at one point I remember you seeing seeing you do alley grind but probably on the t1 round you went backwards like pretty fast and then hopped into a disaster and then went in mm. and i don't think i'd seen any i've never seen anyone do that other than that one clip <clears throat> so there was like a few like that's kind of like a variant of that was that using the crank arm to flip up or how did you do that uh no i think you just hop off the pegs you know oh yeah yeah, I, mean, I, I always feel like all that stuff, I mean, maybe it's been done. I'm sorry, I don't pay attention to it, but it, it seems like you can do that stuff on a rail. Like, you could do a backwards grind to, like, jump up to, like, that's probably been done, right? Backwards grind to, like, jump to sprocket down the last part of the rail or something. But I don't know. I mean, all that stuff, all that stuff was meant to eventually transfer to a rail. I think that's why you learned on our ramps to eventually take it to a rail or something. Oh, okay. But So now, because now you'd see obviously the crank arm down the rail is quite stock on it or yeah. up the rail or whatever but but back then you never saw a crank arm like you say it's like no. figuring out how to slide sideways on the bike jc was figuring them out around then 
um, independently of me. I didn't know he was doing yeah. it. And then Paul Buchanan was starting to figure them out. Like he had, he was starting to do crank arm slides. Oh, okay. Wait, did you get an idea from skateboarding, like the way they disaster slide? Like, I mean, I guess so. It was being at Woodward and just, you just couldn't figure out a way to slide sideways. Yeah. You know? like, that's all you wanted to do. And, or, I mean, that was what I wanted to figure out. Yeah. Well, nice. It was good. Yeah. yeah. Impressive, man. Um, so, then how did you end up, let me go back a bit, leaving Hoffman? Oh, um, well, uh, I've told this story a few times. It Hoffman moved production to Taiwan, and the first samples of the bike I got were pretty wacky, like really wonky geometry. And I just simply didn't have patience for it. To me, it was just like, this has my name on it. I don't like it. It can't be this way. I freak out and I quit. Yeah. You know, Matt was always really cool about it. He's like, man, just give us some time. We got to work through this. And, and you know, back then Taiwan had a really bad name because that's kind of where GT and Hara went and just brought back shit bikes. Yeah. But Matt would always say, and he was definitely right in the end, was that they can make good bikes. It's just people go there because they want cheap bikes. But we're trying to make them make good bikes and it can work out. And uh, it really came down to me just being too, like, I don't know, just too young as well, right? Young, sure caught up in my ideals, and I just couldn't do it. Like, I just quit and decided I was never riding for anybody. I was never going to deal with this crap again. I'm just going to ride whatever bike I want. And Matt was cool. He's like, I know, I always knew you had to do your own thing. It's totally cool. Wow, amazing. Um, within a year, you know, Joe and I were talking about doing T1 because I realized there wasn't a bike I wanted. I bought another Holmes okay. <laughs> and it felt crazy now. Like now it was like too long and you know, the back and I didn't like it. And I think eventually I actually bought like a, ta- a ramp room Taj from someone. Okay. Shit. Yeah. So I was really wrong because I filmed Anthem on that frame, the ramp room Taj, but I wasn't on Hoffman. So going, going way back from our conversation. But, uh, and that bike I eventually, I gave to Christian Regal. He's oh, okay, built yeah. it or building it up. Um, but, uh, well, that was the one with the, like the, the little illustrations on it. Yeah, cool. And you, you ended up, I filmed you when I went to Posh and you was on a SOB. Yeah. Yeah. At, uh, at some point I got on one of those right before T1 started happening. Um, cause Colin was awesome. And, yeah. Um, he'd ridden one of my bikes before and oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. He gave me the scuff video. Yeah. So how long were you on Huffman for then? How many years? 95 to 97. That seemed longer than Yeah. Maybe 94. And yeah, it's short, isn't it? Yeah, it's short, but it seemed like five years or something. Yeah. And we sold a lot of those frames from Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, it was, they, we, they were fine. I just got one bad one. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's the light blue, and then there's the dark blue. There's chrome. Yeah. There was a. There was a complete black as well, wasn't there? At yeah, one point, dark yeah. blue. There was the tans. There was a whole bunch. Yeah. There was a few model years. I thought it was so much longer than that. Wow. And did what about the the low drag bars? Was that your bar? Yeah. What was the how did that come about? Like, well, it sounds crazy now how big everyone's bars are, but Matt had like massive bars. That was a thing in vert is you wrote really big bars. Yeah. You wrote them really far forward. And I couldn't do that. I didn't like that. I wanted like small bars. Yeah. Or even the, or the, the sort of triangular shape. Yeah. That has Patriots, yeah, Patriots, yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Funny. To remember. Um, super forks. Holy crap. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had some super forks. Matt gave them to me. Um, so the low drag was like, a sub eight. Remember, at this point in time, people were trying to get their bars as low as possible, right? Well, <laughs> to flip the stem, put the like, we, yeah, we were riding gyros, so that jacked stuff up, and then the super fork stem was like pretty you know, low, sub sandwich, and then uh, so, but they were pretty low for sure. I always had this theory, which I think is complete nonsense, but. Narrow bars that are low, your hands are here, and tall bars that are wide, your hands are here, and it doesn't really change that much. If you had tall bars that were narrow, you'd be up higher, 
Okay, yeah, yeah, I never thought of that, yeah. And it's not, it's bullshit. No, but, it's not, though. I, 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 this is the stuff I think of now. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the other, the other theory was the, the more straight your arms were, the more you could, like, pull the bunny hop. All right. But, of course, people can bunny hop a whole lot higher now. With, with, with bigger bars, yeah. So that logic is also flawed. But um, I blame this all on Brian Foster. I saw him at Rampage with the teeniest, tiniest little bars, and he was so goddamn rad. I just wanted to be like him, so I wanted small bars. Okay. It's all Brian Foster's fault, This whole the whole small bar thing. I wonder what bars he was riding. That's what makes me think. Yeah. He was, like, still fully racing, so they were, like, tiny. But if you remember Brian racing, he was racing against this just steroid meathead guy. Yeah. And Brian was like little bars like just getting through them. Yeah. Like it was really cool to watch, you know, like the difference in riding styles. But he was that was like how he did it, like just get through. You yeah. Know? Um But he was such an influence. So that's me. that's where the low drag came from. What what about the um the jumping bar was that when you was gone, or was there a jumping bar? Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was a really. I think that was two piece jumping bar. That they because they were like oh. low drags, but like really small. This might have been when you, but, when you was actually still on. I think they came out as part of like the racing stuff, right? Like they were part of like the flash. Flash, like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah uh, I probably had some of those. I don't know. I was. I don't think I had a lot to do with it, but I think it was that the racers wanted. You know, two smaller piece bars, bars. Okay. two-piece bars. Yeah, okay, two-piece. No, I had something like early call at the time. <clears throat> and so, like, so you quit Hoffman and you wrote them like random frames for a bit. Yeah. Uh, filmed Anthem. What, what was the Anthem experience like? Did you guys know that that was going to be like a groundbreaking, another groundbreaking video, or like? Definitely not. Stu just kind of wanted to make a video. He'd made a few videos, and they were all just kind of like. You know, they're great. They were videos, great. But, I thought, but like, he, Scum was real good, I thought. And yeah, but 12 by 1. Like, they're, they're, all, they're all kind of just like him filming his friends. I yeah. never felt like they were like, we're making a video part. It never felt like that to me either. Again, you know, I, th- I think I remember like some of the other people who are a little more conscious of making a video part. Yeah. And just like, oh, we're filming? Okay, all right. You know, I don't know. I never really. Yeah. But, uh, I was definitely around Stu than a man. Stu, Stu was like struggling. He was like selling plasma at blood banks. Oh, okay. To like eat, yeah. you know, and like trying to get video equipment to make a video. And like, I'm sure he knows. He's told the story, but like, I think the reason it's black and white is because he just like couldn't afford good enough equipment, you know, like that the black and white oh, made okay. it look like better, you know. Um, yeah, I remember. But that, that was Stu, like Stu, like maxed out his credit. Card. Like he, had, you know, probably not very much in the way of credit, but like he, he put everything into making that video, and like it worked out for him. So that was really good. Yeah, I, I thought that was a, a, a monumental video for the time, especially as it like it sort of stripped everything away from. It, it was just like the next step in like rawness, mm. whereas it, like a lot of things at that time was kind of like glitzy and colorful and like. And that was just like trails, East Coast, right people. Yeah, I, I thought that was fucking awesome. Yeah, just wondered if like when he was making it, he knew that that was going to be something that people talk about now, which is quite fucking cool. Definitely not. Definitely yeah. know that. Um, I vaguely remember even knowing I was filming for a video, you know. So you just wrote, yeah, as normal. Okay, cool, man. <laughs> there was a few times where we... Like, it was getting close. He's like, let's get the last few clips. I remember that. I remember being like when Joe did a few things that were like some of those gnarly rails. You know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Glad I'm glad Steve pulled that off. It yeah, was, it was yeah. a close one. That, that was, yeah. It was something else, man. <clears throat> and then, like, this is around about the time that T1 is starting to sort of happen, yeah. Yeah, so here I am. I'm up in Bethlehem, hanging out with Joe, and some point we started talking about you both sponsored this at this point yeah yeah he bike quit standard finally anyway. yeah and we it just wasn't what we wanted in a bike you know it was really that simple for me it became a little bigger like it just wasn't what i wanted in the industry too but um you know we eventually decided like we 
we could make the bike we wanted somehow. And so, yeah, that was it. That's how it started. And what did you did you know what direction you, this was going to go in before you started, or did you just put, like let's see what happens? We get we're just going to try this and see what goes on. Oh, we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah, we just knew we wanted to make a better bike, a better frame, and that we wanted to ride, and um, basically just started from there. Where, where did the name come from? I had a UGP shirt, um, and it had like. It was a pretty crazy shirt. It was like eleven colors or something crazy. Like it had old school screen print. Yeah. Know? Um was, was, just, was that the animals one? Yeah, it was drawing oh, they were yeah, like yeah. all these animals are gathered around there, they're burning like a person on a cross. Yeah. And then on the very back there's this little comic and there's a little bunny pointing at a chalkboard. One of my stupid comics. But he's like explaining that there's only one species that, you know, pollutes the planet, it makes war. Yeah. And it's a picture of a person and he's pointing at it and calls it calls them the terrible one okay like the terrible species right like that's human beings that's where it came from we we took that name and like made it mean all kinds of different things but uh that's that's but that's the first inception of it yeah, it's on a UGP shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, cool. we had we had some mom i remember some mom accusing us of being like devil worshippers and the terrible one was like the devil the devil and I did some internet search in the Bible, and they call God the terrible one several times in the Bible. Oh, right. This is actually a phrase that we were totally unaware of. I think we really liked the idea of abbreviating T1. Like that just seemed, it was just like a cool logo. Yeah. And so we went with it. And I, it was definitely Joe who picked it. Like we had this whole list of names, and I'd thrown that on there because of the shirt. And he was like, that's the one. And I kind of was unsure, you know, but that's what we used. Yeah, nice. It was it, yeah, pretty distinct. Like, mm. when, when people haven't heard of it, they're like, what? What's the name? Like, pretty yeah, pretty yeah. weird name, huh? Yeah. yeah. But it didn't yeah. work eventually. You just got used to it or T1 was cool to say. So. And like the art direction was like, was that just a, you just a free for all? You just like, oh, just. Yeah. Like, I remember no. the first shirt were like the countdown, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was just all we could all i could do really yeah. you know this is all i was capable of um but very passionate about yeah i mean we poured everything we had into that for sure yeah. and we did all the zines and stuff yeah yeah like, no it was really cool yeah it's, it's like it's more when i look back at that period of time now it looks more like a current day company than it did for them hmm. which is pretty weird like like the way everything uh, do you know what i mean like ahead of time, yeah yeah like 20 sure. years ahead no, like it was just like it was cool. Yeah, it was like first, it was a big and change. It, it, yeah, and the, the the whole time the Rolfles one came out, all that. Yeah, it was all just that. epic, you know. So you use what on Rolfles one, you knew that you was doing T one already. Okay, Bikes yeah. were already like probably not being welded yet, but they were. I mean, everything was underway. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was like Rolfles one was another sort of groundbreaker, like. So that I think there might even be an advert for T one at the end of Road Falls One, right? I don't know if there's, a, there's like it mentions it in the news. It mentions section. that it's coming out. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And how how was that like? That was received like I would imagine with huge enthusiasm. At that because I, I remember like the the rumblings and the rumors, and it was like, oh, it's going to be this new company. And oh my gosh! And like, we had so much support; it was phenomenal. Like. Like, first of all, we had no idea what we were doing. People lent us money. Um, bike shops paid us ahead of time for bikes that weren't even being made yet. I have seen them. Yeah, knowing it's going to be months, and they would send us money. Um, all our friends helped. Like, it was, yeah, it was unbelievable. We were shocked, you know, and, and so inept at the business side. But yeah. it uh thanks to everyone's patience and support i guess it worked yeah and how was that getting the first like batch of frames was they what were they spooky days yeah ones? well yeah. i think i think oh i hate to get this wrong but i want to say dave didn't even quite work there yet or maybe he was just starting there maybe he ended up having to finish them all 
because it, they took forever. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the wait was like they was coming and then they weren't, weren't they? Mm. Maybe Dave even like came on to like finish them all. But yeah, uh, maybe he was there the whole time. I can't remember. I'm terrible at this. That, that was a good, but that first batch of frames was really fucking like the, the, the frames come out amazing they, they were really sharp and like they were dialed yeah, yeah. they did Dave oh, Spooky they did a great job but what was that was a combination of what an STI and a, and a Taj probably we, we had a king frame oh that's right Joe wrote a king yeah, yeah. Uh, but probably all those really probably probably I mean, I remember us having a Taj and a king on the table and being like, we're going to marry these two. I think the geometry is closer to a king than it is a Taj, if I remember right. Yeah. Shorter back in. Yeah, that's it. And then we did different front end lengths, but I think maybe at first we had the kind of... 20.8, 20, 20. I think, the first one, maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you, you had the progression as well. Progression came at some point, I can't remember, but yeah, those... That wasn't long after, was it? It was, it was pretty quick, yeah. yeah. So I think, so, the T1 was <coughs> October 97, and then Rofels was January 98. Yeah. And then I remember Bike Show was April. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. And there was a progression yeah. there at that point. Hmm. Yeah. I remember that timeline. Yeah, the progression was Robbie's bike. Yeah, it was basically on Roadfuls that he like heard about us. We were going to do this and like, you know, wanted to be part of it. And but that was the first time it was kind of a, an open thing, wasn't it? Re- you, you were talking about it openly in the video, wasn't it? Because Robbie wasn't happy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we yeah we don't. It's not quite open in the video, but I think Robbie's like ready to leave standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he probably knew we were yeah. doing it. So. <laughs> And yeah, uh, that that was a. Uh, and what was what about Road Falls? Was that was that a video that people were like, "This is uh, it's going to change things." Because there's a lot of footage in there that's like that did, that was instantly like, what "Yes, the fuck, what that is one, going on now?" Like that this, one, this is insane. We knew like some of the stuff that had gone down was going to change stuff. Yeah, man, we're like two hours in. We're only at road falls. <laughs> no, we're, we're not. We're, we're hour off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Just that one, I remember. <laughs> this is going all day. This is going. Well, I remember, I remember like, just couldn't wait for that video to come out because there was so much crazy stuff, you know, the backwards rail and like it, but, the church gap and like, it was bananas. Like, but that I, was the first time there was people actually talking about stuff. You know, riders talking about personality, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't that had never been done, had it? I, yeah. I remember. So, okay, I remember. First of all, Chris Roth feeding me a line. I want, I want you to say we drove all day and it sucks, and I had to say that. But I actually loved it. Like, driving all day, like just sitting on a couch with all your friends, it was hilarious. I thought it was a brilliant trip, even though we drove really, really far some days. Um, and then the bus broke down in Austin, and we just, like, everyone was just there for, like, a week filming extra oh, right. you know like it was great well so how long was the, the whole duration of that i i can't remember but I mean, it was kind of like we moved every day but then it hit austin and that was going to be the last day but then we just like got stuck there for okay. a really long time and yeah. I, I lived there but like everyone just stayed around and rode and it was cool yeah i, I would have assumed that that was like at the time be like the guys on the trip knew that oh this is this is something else yeah it was cool, yeah. Yeah. And it, what about the story of like some of the clips that were filmed were not, I suppose that explains it. They weren't on the actual road falls. Oh, um, so Joe and I had some footage that we'd filmed on our own ahead of it. Okay. Like Joe had already done backwards rails, um, but like nobody knew that yet. Yeah. So he, when he did one on road falls in front of everyone, it was like bonkers, right? Yeah. But we already had some. I think I had even, I think I, yeah, I have a little one in there, a little backwards rail. Like I, I never really got comfortable with them, but I had done a little baby one. Um, there wasn't much of that, but there was a f- some clips that we just like gave them because it was in Austin. It was stuff we were riding anyway. All right. Yeah. That's, I heard that. I can't remember where from, but yeah, I heard that story before. <clears throat> so what came after that? So T1 is now going, right? Yeah. There's adverts. There's 
I think there's adverts in props as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, props was part of T1. Oh, it was, yeah. So I don't know if I can remember the exact details, but we basically had props kind of do the sales and distribution of T1. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think this was ever really that public, but like Joe and I just were so clueless with the business side. We need, needed help. And, you know, it, it kind of didn't work out. There's kind of conflicts and we were much more controlling control freaks than we realized. So we yeah. kind of brought it back relatively soon. But at first, the first bikes got shipped from them. And, oh, okay. So they actually bought, cause they, had the contacts to all the, the dealers, I guess, right through the videos. Yeah, I think that was the theory. And just, you know, our idea was like, we'll design the bikes and ride the bikes and they'll sell the bikes. Yeah. You know? Uh, it makes sense, yeah. But it didn't really, didn't pan out as planned. Yeah, it came back to us fairly soon after that, you know, kind of. And what did you, was you guys just shipping it from your houses at that point? At one point it was based out of my apartment apartment yeah and then i moved to olympia in like 99 and joe got a little office oh while yeah i was out of that, town, yeah. like teeny tiny yeah olympia. um and then i was up in olympia for like a year and maybe a half and came back then i worked out of that office then we got another office that was a bit bigger actually got some employees and then then we moved finally moved to like the ramp where we had the ramp. Oh, the T1 ramp, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, I know. What, what was, like, how did it develop? Like, you got, was um, Michael Seibin doing artwork when you was there? Or uh, Yeah, we hired him later. So first, yeah, we got that ramp building. Shit. Yeah, we eventually hired Michael. I think I think I hired Michael while Joe was on the world trip. Remember, he went on that oh, yeah, world yeah, trip yeah. for like six months or something. I want to say I hired Michael then because I was just I really think Mike, Mike was there before then. I think. Was he? Yeah, I was really. I think it was your cousin as well. My cousin was there. Yeah. yeah, I was really not confident doing the artwork. I never felt like what I could do was good enough, and Michael was amazing, and was willing to work for us. Yeah. But the world tour was like two thousand. Four, wasn't it? Was it yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, because it was kind of like that was sort of that trip was sort of the catalyst. Eventually, led to me leaving the company. Mm, but, yeah. Um, and Michael, Michael was definitely there. I remember him being in the meeting when I, when I said I was leaving. But um, well, I remember going, and Michael was there. You were there, Joe, and your cousin. There was four of them in the office. Yeah. And that would have been. Early two, 2000, I think. That was good, good times. Yeah. Right there. So, what, what um, T1 logos did you come up with? I mean, I don't know. The, the, who did the circle with a T? That was me. We did that, that you, yeah. uh, like early on. I want to say, I, I want to say me in it, but I think Joe was like over my shoulder and we were yeah. working on it. Uh, I mean, all the first ones I did. And then. And the, the the I meant the the font it was like on the on the sleeve of the the t shirt and like the the bars as well that yeah, that was yeah. cool yeah that was just yeah straight Helvetica I think yeah uh, uh like yeah all the like the little the the one that was like the first infantry badge um so so that was the shield kind of logo. yeah it's like a shield with a upside down one yeah that's it yeah that was another good one and that one. Had, so if you're in the military and you're defeated, you turn your badge upside down. Okay. And so that was sort of like an upside down one. I don't know. It kind of had some weird okay. military kind of t- connotations that we didn't really intend, but it kind of fit. Worked, yeah. <clears throat> and the bars. I remember the bars were hugely popular as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You remember them? Yeah. And they, they were small. They, were like, mean, they reminded me of a Hoffman who, bar. Who made those bars? So first... Moss, they, Moss built them. Literally, like hundreds, hundreds of those bars are sold. Yeah, lo- loads. Yeah, Moss I mean, built we them. We just couldn't give them stock, and they kept on bending as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that Moller, uh, you have to get the whole story from Moller, but I remember hearing some story from him where he like he was making them, and like 
knew they were going to bang. Like, knew they weren't as strong as they could be. But, like, they just kept selling. And mm. like, I don't understand, you know. That's, a, that's something story like that. But but during that time, the bike, you know, the bike was, it was Primo, T1 bike. Yeah, yeah. It was epic, wasn't it? it was, every bike had that. Yeah. That setup. Well, it? well, the bars were fine until you, until you come off or you landed heavy. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember the, the the gauge being really thin on the bars. Like they didn't even when you looked at them, it was like they looked too thin. Because mm. I had the small ones, quite a few sets, and they seem like really swept as well, like yeah. extra swept. They did have a lot of sweep. Yeah, I think they were like normal thicknesses, like oh six five or something. Maybe it was that that extra sweep that like yeah. made them like. But what size were they? The small ones were like was sub at eight, I'd say. Maybe the big ones were like eight. Not even. I don't think the big ones were even eight. There was yeah, two I, sizes. Weren't they didn't they? have to be eight though. Oh, no, I think they were smaller. Bars. Slam bars were eight, weren't they? Yeah, but slam bars were a bit huge at that point in time. Yeah, they were. So I think like one set, maybe the big set. You could probably find out mm. they're being an old ass. Seven, seven, five. Yeah. And seven and a half, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably that, yeah. And I would definitely cut them down. Oh, and the, the Primo thing, like, that was another good sort of, that, like Ian said, it went alongside everything at the time. Yeah, that was really cool. Primo was awesome to us. I added, like, signature tires and grips. Yeah. And, um, and eventually they distributed T1. So you was on Primo when you was on Hoffman? No, I got a Primo. When you was on T1? Pretty sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who, who was that, that that asked you to ride a Primo? Greg Walsh. Was it Greg or was, was it... Was it Castillo? Was it Castillo? Castillo. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember, I'm La, sorry. It was La, wasn't it? It wasn't La. No? No, he, we never met La till kind of later. Uh, he, okay. I think he was there. I think it might have... I don't remember. Because at the same time... Like, Greg was definitely... Sorry. Same time what? Same time. Because volume started the same time, like a year after T1, didn't it? Like Did six it? months. Yeah, yeah, it was close. Yeah. It was close, yeah. yeah. So those guys left Primo mm. to go and do... So maybe volume. it was like Brian that got me on and then... And Greg took over. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I think of Primo, I think of Greg. Like he was yeah. the one who really took care of us. Okay. But... Yeah, and we did the T1 pegs. In, in like oh, that's right. Yeah, that was a hot product, there. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I made those up. Uh, I actually found some Haro aluminum peg, and like had the machine down, and then cut a top tube or a down tube from an old frame, and like sleeved it over them. Oh, okay. And to me, it just solved everything. They're lighter. They grind faster because the metal's harder. They have a soft end, so they won't screw up ramps. And I was really proud of those. Blue and silver. Yeah. Blue ends. There was gold ones too. Oh, there's gold ones. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> there was black at one point. The black. There might even yeah. been a red set. But also, titanium pegs were picking up then, and you could do titanium sleeves, and it would be cheaper than making a whole titanium peg. But we didn't like titanium because it made the coping slow, so we didn't make those. But we had a sample. Wait, did they come in singles or as a pair? A pair. That's what I thought, yeah. That's weird, isn't it? To think now that they came in a pair. <laughs> <clears throat> Lucky it wasn't four back then. And with the tyre, that I remember the original tyre they made that didn't work or something. You remember, so you remember I had, that? I think I had four Primo tyres, because um, we would do front and a back. Yeah, and there was one... Gosh, this is a not good record for me of my designing capabilities but it, <laughs> it looked cool but then when I actually wrote it it had like a center tread that my mind would make it faster and going straight but then you could roll off that to get grip but it would like actually kind of you'd kind of like it just fit. wobble yeah like on a ramp you'd almost like slip when it went off that center tread I said that protruded the the actual so yeah the, nothing the, like the wrapped off it you know okay. like usually on a center tread you have it kind of wrap around to like hold it together this was just like when it inflated, it'd just be like this little mohawk sticking yeah. up, and it kind of. Mm. And I hated it so much that I like demanded they make a new one, and they did. But what, what was the one after it? There was another one that had like a whole bunch of little like. No, so the one after it kind of wrapped around more, 
and it well we'd have to look them up but they're yeah, just okay. kind of different so i remember that one had like a, a sort of olive green like patch on it the one that didn't work i only mm. saw them a couple of times but i can't remember the other one yeah and you had a grip as well yeah had a grip yep i had a coalition that was later coalition group yeah the grip was cool i thought yeah yeah the grip was good he's like it was like two different it was like ribbed and then diamond was it, was it diamond yeah 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 that was cool and that was a good experience primo yeah it was pretty good yeah um the video they made the video as well didn't they? it's funny that like you quit hoffman because of the, the taiwan connection and then like primo is like everything's <laughs> made in taiwan well we're getting close to why i leave t1 okay and that was also because the bars were banning Ooh. all the time and this is about time some companies are coming out with bars made in Taiwan and like I see had the the race fork. Yeah. Made in really. Taiwan, super light, super strong, unbelievably strong at, at the time for how light it was. And bars from Taiwan were, you know, half the price but were stronger and frames were starting to get good, your frames are coming in and like Sandy was on them and they were like perfectly okay and they were cheaper and so all of a sudden to me the reason we were doing t1 was to make the best stuff we could was becoming an issue because there was better stuff now coming from overseas than we could make like we talked to our handlebar maker at the time you know the tubing supplier we want to do butted bars like remember all the bars were getting like super yeah, butted yeah. all over like 11 butted bars and mm. they were like oh yeah we could do that but it'd be like 200 dollars just for the tubing you know, and it was like, well, shoot, they're cheaper, they're lighter, they're stronger. What are we doing? And that, that became like a point of conflict for me and Joe. Oh, know? okay. Because I, if it, we could make it better somewhere else, then we had to do that. You know? yeah. It wasn't about being made in America. That was not the point for me. And I don't really think it was for him, but he just wanted to have more control. Yeah. And he was probably right. Like going to Taiwan is a big step and you know, we can't like run over to the factory and look at stuff. Yeah. So anyway, eventually I came around to the stuff made in Taiwan and certainly came around to, um, even more so now, nowadays. Yeah. Know, I've working for a bike company. Yeah. Well, I think they've got better making stuff as well. Haven't they? So. Yeah. And I, I think Matt was right. I mean, I think they always could have made good stuff. It's just people went there cause it was cheap Yeah. and they wanted the lowest possible price and yeah, you care about quality yeah they there. wanted cheap stuff so they got cheap stuff yeah, yeah. but no, i mean yeah i've been i've been to the factories now and they can they're no offense to the american factories i've been to but they're way nicer and they can do a whole lot better work than you know just like extruding custom tubes on demand like we can't do that here yeah know? um and was there any um primo products that you got offered that never came out? No, they wanted, I think the super tenderizer, one of those pedals was gonna, I wanted to do a pedal and they kind of just like designed one for me and I hated that pedal, it was like too big and blocky. Okay. Um, so that was maybe gonna be my pedal, but I tell you, I didn't want my name on it. Um, but there was a, there was a pre, there was Primo Pro stuff, wasn't there? Prima Pro pedal came out. Yeah, that was really blocky, wasn't it? That yeah. was worse. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was maybe that one. It was yeah. kind of right around then when I yeah. left. There yeah. was that Prima. There was Prima. There was Prima Pro stuff. Um, wasn't was a lot of Prima Pro stuff US made? I think. No. Was the no. bars not US made, or are they just better? They did do some US made bars. I I've think. got some I recollection of yeah. Prima making something in the US. Yeah. But I don't know what. You, hmm. Right. There was something. I don't remember that, but C can you remember there. how the Primo thing came to an end? Like what, what happened there? Oh, I, I know how it came to an end, but yeah. Do you? I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. I got it. Greg, Greg Walsh. He left got, and started coalition. Yeah. 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 I can't really I think remember. You guys went with it, right? We did, but I don't remember you, really what happened. How, but. Yeah. I don't remember what happened, but yeah, I remember that. That was the, <clears throat> that was what happened to it. Um, and then like, so where where are we now? We're, I guess I'm about to leave T1, or I just left T1. Yeah. So what, what about the T1 brand? Like, how did you have input into that? Oh hell yeah. Yeah. I, 
built a lot of it or like at least you know did what i could i let corgan yeah. and wessel and those guys build it and how did that like evolve like was was that just gonna you just thought that was gonna be a single ramp and then it just or did you always have ideas it's like we're gonna this is gonna expand into something else it was a single ramp and then definitely this happened while joe was on that world tour i decided we could bowl in the back part you know? okay um and then from there we realized we could just keep going you know like and why not like it seemed like no one was upset that we had a ramp right downtown so we just went with it and yeah, the what a special place! Like holy cow! That I, was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the best ramp ever, as far as I'm ever got to ride, and just loved it. And just like the location, the location, right, right downtown in the heart of Austin, and just but secret somehow. Yeah, and like we had bands play there, and we did just had everyone over, and like. I mean, it was just a cool the place to like well. hang out. The building as well. Yeah, even yeah. even if you weren't riding, it was just like a good yeah. place to be. It was really, really special. Yeah, exactly. And there, there was like a lot of land there as well, wasn't there? Like, no, I mean, we filled up the entire. Backyard. But I mean, that's what I mean. Like, oh, we, yeah. like there was a lot of land to, to play with. Like, yeah, the right amount. Like we filled it all with a ramp by the end, and there wasn't any more room. But it was like plenty big enough. Yeah, place that that was like the dream spot at one point when it was like everyone that that would be on the videos. And every person would be like, oh, "I need to go to the team." Yeah, it was, a must like, it was yeah. on the list, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, to get it was worth it. I mean, I could ride that thing every single day, and never get bored. Yeah, it was wonderful. <clears throat> Can you remember like some of the highlights of people riding that ramp? Like who who turned up there and uh, and killed that place? Well, I remember a few. I mean, there's a bunch of awesome sessions. Yeah, I can remember a few. So here's one. We had band play. Um, Hobble was the name of the band. It's in it's a song in one of the T1 video. But um, so they're playing on the floor, and Paul Buchanan and I were riding the ramp, and you could kind of like pump around them, and then do like a big air, and you had a lot of speed. And when that band was playing, there was just so loud, just the bowl just focused the sound that you couldn't hear your tires. You'd, you kind of lose your sense of speed without like that feedback. And Paul and I were just both of us just blasting and like really inspired by the music. And it was just a really good moment with Paul because he never really got to ride with Paul. And yeah. It was both of us riding. It was really cool. And the other ones, I, I distinctly remember riding with Chase Hawk and he was still little kid Chase Hawk. And we used to play like a game of bike on the ramp and I, I could usually get him on some old school trick that he'd never heard of. <laughs> da, da, you know, it's cool. And he'd come around and he'd come around here and there. And then all of a sudden he was just better than any of us. And I was like, what happened? You know, like I ride here every single day, how this happened. But Chase just suddenly went from being really good Chase to now he's doing his own thing and it's turned up. And that was really amazing to see. Yeah. You know? Like, uh, well, what, wow, was that's the, a good what was the time time scale of, of Chase being like the got me man yeah I don't know it must be a few years though right like, yeah, yeah 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 it turned up pretty quick and it just seemed like it came out of nowhere like you know there's Chase I can I can beat him in a game and bike and then but boom yeah he's better than all of us who was the there was two brothers that used to ride there that were real good as well yeah yeah I can't uh, remember their names. I think one of them rode for Fly, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Dylan. Dylan. And... Oh, fuck. They were a really good kid. They were amazing, yeah. Uh, this isn't an insult to them. My memory's just bad. But yeah, they were awesome. <clears throat> and like, so... So after you left T1, like, what was... You still lived in Austin for a bit, or...? yeah. Uh, and what you, you end up on Odyssey at, at some point. End up on Odyssey after Coalition. I don't remember what happened to Coalition. I think it just faded out, didn't it? Um. Yeah, I was still in Austin. Struggling with my memory here. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no worries. Uh, and then you filmed for the Odyssey video. Electronical. Electronical. Yeah. We, I think you wasn't on a T1 in that, right? 
No, I was riding a giant. Okay. Uh, mostly. Uh, so at this point, I'm hurt. I'm really having problems with my back, which I okay. eventually get surgery on. And it was a rough time. Like I was l- later realized I was just in constant pain. Like that. I mean, just all my energy is on pain management. You know, it's really hard to like run. That was when you was filming for that video. Yeah, this whole like three years or section in there after T1 probably. Um, and it eventually got to the point where I would go to like a contest and know I couldn't practice because if I practiced, I wouldn't be able to walk the next day. So I'd have to just like do my run and it was not pleasant, you know, like it was just pain, but I didn't really even realize it, it was just like, just so constant that it was just there. Um, but that's sort of when the giant thing came in because I started as right when I started, I found a, I can tell this whole story. I found a old granny bike with a basket on it in a dumpster, pull out a dumpster and I was hurt, you know, but I could ride this thing to the grocery store. And I realized that I really enjoyed that just riding down the street. <laughs> it was actually really cool. Cause all of a sudden you're like, you don't have to do tricks. You don't have to think about doing stuff on this rickety old bike. You just go back to the very core of just riding a bike and how good that feels. Yeah. And it actually changed my riding. I made a point to like focus on doing more stuff that simply felt good. That was really simple rather than trying to do a lot of tricks. But anyway, then I had a friend at giant and I hit him up for like a road bike or something thinking I was kind of hurting, couldn't ride that much, but I could like at least get exercise. Yeah. And I liked that. So then I got like a mountain bike and I didn't like that. And then I got like a fixed gear bike and I didn't like that so much. But the point was I was buying bikes from giant and then they offered to sponsor me. And I was like, well, that doesn't, this is like fucks up my whole thing. Like I was trying to, I never rode for a corporate company. But I just bought their bike. So I yeah. obviously like support their products. It really messed with my head. But I was done with T1. I kind of felt done in the sport as an influence because I was like hurt so bad and felt old and like but I could ride and they had we had talked about like I would go to different events, go to mountain bike events, go to road bike events and just like experience those other types of cycling, which I was realizing I yeah. enjoyed. This all made sense to me at the time, but I know that me riding for Giant was a very weird thing, and it ended up being very weird. It only lasted like a year and a half, but uh, so that that's how that happened. I ended up getting fired via a letter with my name spelled wrong. It was real weird riding for them. But uh, what? So what? Uh, what was the frame? Uh, they made a. It was like the frame Corey Bowen ride road. Oh, okay. Some, it was actually pretty good. Um, and it was like just like a race frame. And what they, I they, think, did I think, have a, they did have a thing going. Didn't I don't they? remember. Yeah, they had, they had Mosh, didn't they? Yeah, I they remember Mosh, Mosh but yeah. I don't remember like them having anything else. So Corey rode for Giant Heath Pinter, and actually they had both had T ones. I think like it was basically a T one Geo. Oh, okay. Um, but like made in China, it was the first China bike I'd ever ridden, and it was. Fine. Yeah. Was weird me out. That, he was running that program. I can't remember his name. Well, Mike Ardeline was, he was at there. first, but he kind of left almost right when I started. And then Heath Pinter kind of yeah. was the default, de facto team manager. And Kevin Dana was there. I said, yeah. Kevin, Kevin yeah. really wasn't the team manager. He was more like a... The guy. The designer. Yeah. The engineer. yeah. But they were all cool. Um, but it just never really turned into anything. None of the stuff that we talked about ever happened. And like... I'd pitch ideas and never happened. And yeah, it's a really weird thing. Giant is this massive company, but they're the American giant that I was writing for is like a, like a licensing deal with the real giant. Okay. So they were just kind of like, I never really understood how it worked, but they didn't really have the capacity to like make changes or do a lot of stuff that I thought we could do. Yeah. And like sending me all these events never happened. And, Anyway, but also I was really hurting and kind of right about the time that ended, well, right at the time that ended, I got surgery on my back finally. So that was kind of basically the end of my BMX career. Okay. Yeah. But what did you get? Like, did they pay you good money for riding the giant? Or was mm-hmm. it, no. I mean, it was not much. It was like, oh, that's crazy. Huh? Because I thought 
I I treated them like a co-sponsor in my mind. I, mean, I know that your bike sponsor is usually a big yeah. sponsor, but to me, I was still on Eddie's, and to me, it was like this was my I don't know, like, like a handlebar sponsor. Like I'm not even going to mention yeah. them. I'm not going to wear their shirts. But yeah. I'll ride the frame, and they're okay. going to pay me a little bit, and I'm going to go do all this other stuff. This is what I did it for. Yeah, but yeah, uh, that's mad because I I thought that I just assumed oh there must be some huge money involved there. <laughs> I want to say it was like a thousand bucks a month or something, which is not bad, yeah. but like you would yeah you would think yeah it would be huge a month company. or something. Yeah, yeah. I seem to remember talking to you about it, but you said, well, what do I do? Do I take this or go out and get a job, a real job? There was that too, like. I had always had that feeling, you know, when, when you get old and you're done with BMX, you just step out. You don't yeah. milk it. And I didn't, but also I was also like, but I'm really in love with all types of bikes now. So maybe this can work if I can do all this other stuff. Like they yeah, did take okay. me to Whistler once and that was really cool. But um, you weren't that old. You were 30. Four? I was 36. 36. 36 when I had surgery, so probably like 35. Yeah, yeah. But I was in so much pain. Yeah, that was that was the issue, wasn't it? It felt like it was over, you know. Yeah. Like I was never going to be able to push it again. And, um, the only like... When, when did that start? When did you start getting that? A few years back? before that, like I had a really bad crash on T1 where it was like one of those alley grinds where I landed on one hip and you're going backwards on this weird angle and it just twisted my back super hard. And tore a bunch of discs in the lower back quite badly. Um, and it just never got better. I mean, I tried everything, you know, like with all these different doctors. And eventually, down the line, you end up at a surgeon who tells you you need surgery. Did you, before you injured your back, did you ever feel like the pressure of like, oh, I'm getting too old to uh, be pro or no? No. The only thing I felt though was that i was starting to get a little jaded on the travel side you know like which is the job side yeah. right like i i just want to stay home and ride t1 like i'm like this is all this is it yeah i don't i go to contests and i don't get to ride very much because there's so many people and you know but i can stay here and ride all day every day and that's what i want to do so that was the only side of it but no i the riding side never never was a job and never was an issue. It was more the travel side. Okay. Well, interesting. That's kind of like what people do now. Mm. They, when they, they get to a certain age, you just like just want to ride by and park. Yeah. Like, but where... I think at that point you've been on the road for since yeah. ninety. Yeah. You've been on the road for ten years. Ten, ten plus, plus years. Yeah. Yeah, more than that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and yeah, I think there was some slight changes too. Like Eddie's was starting to starting it was not a big thing but like a few times a year that wants to go do some demo or something yeah just a few things i kind of didn't want to do and i kind of mm. always never but it, it was a different kind of traveling to what the guys are doing now they're going to a city going to an airport yeah. being riding every day yeah. with their friends you yeah. were going to do demos to a contest yeah. or whatever it was a different kind of traveling and you were there just for that weekend and you were gone yeah and then the next place you know yeah, I'm kind of making up for that now. I'm trying to travel more and like see some of the places yeah. I just like saw an arena and like went home. Yeah. And, uh, but that, yeah, I mean, I never was jaded on the riding, but I got a little jaded on the, you know, those responsibilities. Yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, you still still love to do the, the act of. Hmm. Yeah, I kept it. I, I fought for that, you know, like I turned down bigger salaries and money. So that I could keep it how I wanted it. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> Who were some of the uh, the companies that tried to uh, get you on board? Oh wow! Uh, that you I turned down. Well, really early on, it was like GT, you know, like Woody Hitson. Okay. I don't know. That would have been big money, but it would have been more than I was making. Yeah. But it would have been a shit a lot of shows and stuff I didn't want to do. And then there was, I don't know. There was just there's companies that would want you to be in the X games and kind of want to base part of your salary on X games performance. And that would just re flat out refuse. Yeah. Um, well, any, any sunglasses, uh, sponsors come your way? No, they didn't. Okay. Um, I remember, I think it was like Fox when we wrote for Fox, they, they, 
it was Fox or Giant. One of them wrote a contract. I remember them saying like, normally our contracts are like 20 pages long and you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to wear a shirt at all times. And your contract is one page and it basically just says, you do you and we'll support you. Like that was like the kind of stuff I would get, yeah. which, you know, isn't how it was for other people. But compare like my Fox contract to like Mira's Fox contract. And I bet there was, you know, yeah. more numbers on there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, understandably so, of course. Yeah. Aside from the fact that he, he was David Merritt, like he was gonna do the stuff that I, I yeah, just, I just had to do it my own way. But Fox at one point were quite tied in with T One, wasn't they? they? They yeah, I think didn't you have like pants or something like? No, I don't think we had that. But I thought you had like T One cargos. Was I, that? I think it was just because Robbie. Paul was on Fox as well because they had that poster. They sponsor our whole team. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the poster was the big poster, wasn't it? Yeah, there was like a, a like the team. Yeah, the picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. They wanted to sponsor. I don't know. I think they wanted to sponsor me and Joe specifically, but we demanded they sponsor the whole team. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it was cool. Yeah, I mean, it was. This was John Fox, who's like awesome, and he was kind of designing the clothes, and he had this real different approach from the rest of the brand which was you know very racing focused brand um and he wanted to like do more lifestyle so he like kind of latched on to us and then there was this other part of the brand that was more competition based and that's like where some of the other riders came in but, okay because um, they, they made the videos as well i remember yeah they made a couple of bmx videos it, it, it was good we didn't really fit in the end, but like they were good to us. Yeah, nice. I think uh, it might have been Lee Reynolds was designing some of that stuff as well at that point. Was he? Yeah. Mm. I interviewed him recently. He said he worked there around that period of time. Yeah. He didn't specifically say the T1 period, but it, it fitted into what he was huh. saying. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it was kind of a transition phase for them where they were coming out of that sort of motocross, metal militia, uh, crusty demons and dirt kind of world. It was all like, Vegasy chrome shirt stuff into like actual casual clothes. Yeah. And so we were kind of on, you know, we were starting to get like cooler clothes. But at first it started out with this like just motocross stuff that we just wouldn't want to touch. You know? Yeah. But then John's like design started coming in and got better. Nice. Yeah. Um, who, like, who were some of the riders that like in the sort of late 90s? early 2000s that you sort of looked at as uh, like as good who was doing good riding for you like at that period of time like in that very for me a very important late time. 90s 2000s. oh my gosh yeah. it's so specific uh, Mr. Ian Morris of course our guest host definitely I mean I had backyard videos were okay so you me. used to get the, the UK videos there because I came over here yeah like, okay and like I was excited to show them to other people, you know, like that, that didn't you see them. But uh um you know, I was spent a lot of time at Woodward okay. around that time, and so it was like those dudes who were at Woodward. There was Kimler and Joe Rich and I don't know, you know, Van came around yeah. at some point there. Garrett Burns. Uh Hoffman, of course, was always yeah, Hoffman. Yeah, always, yeah. Miron. So kind of like the people that you would, that I would I would expect anyway, yeah. But what, like what, trail wise, like because that, that was like a kind of a, a different kind of thing that sort of happened a bit bit after. Yeah, I mean, I I got to spend this time at Posh, some you know, and just amazing there. Yeah, and every one of those dudes, like it. Posh reminded me a little bit of Austin in a way because it was these guys who mostly rode and were awesome but like weren't they weren't getting paid for it they weren't really even trying to do the stuff that would get you paid for it they just wanted to ride every day and that was very inspiring you know like i wanted to keep that even though i was getting paid for it and it wasn't my yeah. job i wanted to remember no it's cool to just go through the trails and do turn bars yeah like don't forget that like remember how good that feels and keep doing it yeah um do you think that that added to your riding riding 
for them a couple of years at Posh? Like, do you think that developed what you was doing? Hell yeah. I mean, you guys, like, you and Joe, like, I, I remember, for me, I'd watch you, like, you'd, I'd watch people ride, like, wooden stuff, and they'd ride it very, like, freestyle. And then at some point when, like, trail riding became a bit of a thing, you guys rode the wooden stuff like it was trails, mm-hmm. and it just changed it, and that's kind of that's yeah. kind of how I ride now, or I try to ride now, yeah. or, or yeah. just kind of what developed. It was a different type it of ramp ride. It was totally different, yeah. 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 And I think, well, the whole bike changed as well. You changed yeah, the whole it, bikes as well. Yeah. Because the, the front brake was going. Yeah. The so front brake was off the two pegs or, yeah, on, or then, no pegs. And or, the dirt tyre on the front. Yeah. <laughs> the V-Monster was, you know. And that well, that must have been around that sort of time that you mm-hmm. guys were, were hitting posh, like that that's kind of developed into something else, mm-hmm. I would guess. Maybe I'm wrong, but like. Oh yeah, I mean that dirt jumping and posh especially because even the dudes who were just the dirt jumpers could like ride street still and they were yeah. really good bike handlers and um, that was a big influence on me. Yeah, yeah. like because I went to the early posh too, like before I lived there, and just was kind of amazed that there was these like racers who yeah. could hit jumps and like do rails and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was great. Being yeah, that was a strong there. scene, wasn't it? Back then, it always still is now. Like, but yeah, Gower and all those dudes. Just thinking back to the time, the T1, you know, sort of '97. So, when did it end? 2004, five. For me. Yeah. Yeah. It was. To, you know, you think if you think about that time scale now, six years, five, six years, whatever. But it's a hell of a lot of impact. In that yeah. Time. You know what I mean? But it seemed like. It seemed like it was long, much it seemed, longer than that. It seemed that way to me too. I mean, I, I think that's because we're, we're the age we're at now. Yeah, we poured. I mean, I poured so much into that time mm. too. Like, I was you know prime of my health and life, and I could just pour in the hours to that stuff. Like mm. everything we did, you know, like it's just over the top how much we put into it. Yeah, but I remember it seemed. You know, we, I must have been there so many times and being there felt like it was like a longer period. Mm. And yeah, just thinking back on it now, mm. it seems like a lot of stuff happened. It, you know, when did when did Ruben come into the picture and all that? Yeah. There was so much happened, wasn't there? Yeah. And then the whole video as well. Well, if you even if you looked at the first three years of T1, like from 97 to 2000, mm. it seems like... There's only three years, and it seemed like forever. Yeah. Mm. Maybe it was just our time. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it's the kids, the riders' time now. It felt longer than it was. Well, it was at that time where it was magazine. Yeah, and there was. Yeah. A, you you got to remember as well. There's a lot going on. So it when I when I asked people like the older guys about eighties, like so eighty two to like eighty five. Mm just fucking seems like decades because mm. there's so much happened, especially in like in 84, it was just like, yeah. and it's the same thing. Like later on, yeah. like ni- like 97 was, well, from 95 to 2000, there was like, bah, 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 bah. there's a lot of stuff going on. And in like 97 to 2000, there was even more, you know, it started in 95 to come back, creeping yeah. back. And then it just was like concentrated, like bah, bah, bah. Mm. a lot of shit happened in that time. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. So in that time, you know, like two thousand and four, then when did the Etnies thing come to an end? You know? Yeah. That, that few like few years later and the Primo it all seemed to happen at kind of the same time, didn't it? Well Primo turned into coalition. Yeah, but that that was That was short lived. Yeah, but that was two thousand and six, was it? Yeah. Two thousand five. Yeah, trying to piece it together in my head. Yeah, I can't remember exactly, but I, to me, it all kind of ended with surgery. You know, yeah. I came out of surgery, did my rehab six months. I'm like, oh shit. And I, what, what, so, what did they do on the surgery? Uh, so, they took out one of the discs in my lower back, like in your, your spine, you know, your vertebrae are like big down here and they get like smaller as you get up yeah. there. So, they took out one of the really big ones and then. They like grow bone 
put they grow a bone between it. So you basically can't really move there. You can't move there anymore ever because it's now a solid bone between these two vertebrae. Um, but then the ones above it were also quite damaged. And they wanted to fuse like, you know, my whole lower half, which would be terrible. You'd lose so much movement. So I only let them fuse the really bad one and that took away the pain. All of a sudden that pain was gone. But now like if I really push it, I get quite a lot of you know, nerve damage, pain from the already ruptured ones that are up higher. Cause they have to bend more. Well, they can't fix that more. Um, you know, there's probably some surgery they could clip it or something, but it's quite, quite frightening that stuff, isn't it? Mm. Over the years. I mean, now, now I'm like more or less. Okay. I'm about to turn 50. Yeah. But, uh, it was just, you know, I had to call, Odyssey was still paying me, and I just had to call and be like, gosh, stop paying me. Yeah. You know, it's not happening. Um, and that was, that was okay. I don't know. It just yeah. felt natural to me. But you, Do you have to stretch or any? Do you, do you do anything to? So I tried so much for so many years, but now it's just, it's, there's no, there's no fix. It was just sort of like slowly getting stronger. Again. Yeah. I don't know. I think teaching your body how to be on a bike again. And it's still like the reason I haven't really picked up a BMX again is because just getting into that position, it's like you, know, you bend over at your lower back and I can't bend there and it doesn't feel right. And it just sort of, it hurts if I try to bunny hop. Yeah. So I just, the reason I've picked up other bikes is because I don't, Hold, put my hands on some mountain bike grips. I don't have any expectations. Put my hands on BMX grips. Okay, and like, yeah. I know what I'm supposed to be able to do, and I can't do it. And it hurts. So, uh, I just left them. But I'm still, I'm still riding bikes. Yeah, I'll say you used to doing BMX tricks on um, just bigger bikes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bigger bikes and mellower jumps. <laughs> mm, it's fine. Yeah, nice, man. I, I, I saw the. Uh, there was one standout for me. I was like, you did your 540 tire tap on something like dirt lip. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck it. That was a good 540 tire tap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like a, you did a tire slide or something along the edge of something. And I was like, oh, I need to jump to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool, man. Bikes are good. <clears throat> so, and what, so what do you like, how do you day to day now? What, what are you doing? You mean right now on my trip? No, like, uh, like just for um for, for like how do you get through the yeah so i'm freelance design i guess i don't know i do illustrations and cartoons and animation and i've written some kids books and i work for fairdale which is a company i st helped start um doing graphics and some design work I work for pink bike doing cartoons okay and then occasionally I get like animation gigs from random sources, usually in the bike industry. All right. Um, and somehow that all adds up to a living. Oh, wow. It's That's good. It, it truly reminds me a lot of bike riding in that I um, have something I can pour myself into and my creativity can, you know, is useful and there's no, there's no end to what you can learn. And it's also like bike riding in that like there's always someone better than you at yeah. anything, but you got to just find what feels right to you and do it. And that like becomes, a, that's fine. Yeah. That, bec that becomes the way you, you do it. Yeah. You can't be the best bike rider. You can't be the best illustrator, but you can like kind of do, if you can find your own thing to do, like, and it feels good. Like that's, yeah. that's cool. Nice. Uh, and, and now you're, you're in the UK, got the boat from the US, <laughs> rode halfway through America. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so people that haven't been following me too closely, I sold my house a few months ago, sold everything I owned, got in my car, started driving. That got boring, so I sold my car on the side of the road, hopped on a plane, and went to Whistler, uh, big mountain bike park. Spent two and a half months there riding mountain bikes down hills, riding up chairlifts. That was awesome. I don't care what kind of bikes you're into, riding down a hill is fun at all times. So that was great. Then I flew back, visited my aunt and some family and my mom and stepdad in Detroit. And I pedaled from Detroit to Brooklyn, which was a 12-day ride for me. Got on a big cruise boat, 
and showed up in England, rode away from the docks, and now I'm here. And I'm about to head over to the Netherlands tomorrow. That's what you want. Yeah, I'm going to like ride around for like two months or so. And then, and then I don't really know. I, I don't have a home. I don't really know where I want to live. I'm trying to figure that out, but I'm really open. And right now I'm just really happy traveling and I'm like working from the road. And it's, it's pretty well, cool. you, have you got a return ticket on that boat or you don't know you're getting back yet? I got a flight. Okay. I kind of needed one to like, yeah, I don't think you can show up in England without a return. Oh, I know. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah. I have a flight like in kind of middle October back to Detroit. Right. And then, I don't know, I'm kicking around. I might go down to Austin, see some friends, kick around going to New Zealand for the winter. I'm just sort of open. We'll see what happens. Cruising. Nice. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I'm good if you are. <laughs> yeah, you got anything else? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's good. That was fucking okay, awesome, man. Huh? Yeah, it was sick. All right. Thank you, guys. That was the, bit I, the early bit I wanted to know about. Hello. Right. So we've just got a Patreon page. We've been doing this show for nearly two years, and it's... It, well, it will remain free, and it has always been free. But if you want to become a supporter or send something our way, go to our Patreon page. I think there's four tiers. There's a lot of benefits to most of the tiers. Uh, thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. Uh, we're going to try and do more of these if we can get the right amount of funding back in. So if you can support, please do. Thanks. See ya.